Good morning, everyone. Fantastic. Really, everybody's got here really timely fashion. So, so that's wonderful. Thank you very much. So this is the future we want. Not this webinar, obviously, particularly, specifically, um, but that's what we're here to talk about today. So very much looking forward to having a really positive and inspirational discussion as far as we're able to, obviously, given the subject matter, given the challenges, given the, the current political environment. But uh, that's what we're, the challenge we've set ourselves for today. So I'm very much looking forward to that. We'll get right into it soon, but as ever, just a few procedural points. So firstly, please keep your microphones muted when you're not talking, obviously. Um, and use the raising your hand function to get, get my attention. Um, and I will do my best to, to pay attention to that. Um, and um, also you've seen the thing flash up, hopefully to say that the, the session will be recorded um, and I think is going to be made available as well later if that, that makes any difference to you. Um, so we, we've got quite quite a few opinions and we want to, to really um, bring, bring everybody's opinions together. Firstly, I'm going to ask Claire Hay to set the scene, talk to us about um, this series of discussions that we're having, um, and then we will go from there. So Claire, please. Thanks, Gillian. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this second series of Pathways to Net Zero roundtable discussions. Um, firstly, my sincerest thanks to Trueform for kindly sponsoring these events, to the Foundation for Integrated Transport for providing grant funding, and to the Greener Transport Council, without whose invaluable support, none of this work would be possible. This is a critical time for the net zero agenda. At our discussion on Monday, concern was expressed about the change in tone the new government remains reportedly committed to net zero, but only if it doesn't interfere with its plans to drive economic growth. It's unclear what the government's new priority means for the levelling up agenda, and there are grave concerns about the intended rollback on environmental regulations. Meanwhile, Labour has set out net zero as central to its pitch for 2024 and is calling for a green industrial strategy. These are, to say the least, turbulent times politically. However, what we need is consistency of policy over time. This is absolutely critical for engaging investor confidence and for businesses and driving, driving the crucial investment we need over the long term. The cross-party consensus that was forged at the time of the 2008 Climate Change Act has been critically important in driving forward the net zero agenda and engaging the private sector. We cannot afford a stop start approach. It is absolutely vital that central government remains a strong and vocal and unequivocal advocate for the net zero transition. A report published this week by the House of Lords Environment and Climate Change Committee says that government will fail to meet its medium term carbon reduction targets if it doesn't engage actively in, in behavior change. Working with the Climate Change Committee, they have calculated that 32% of emissions required through to 2035 will require on, will, will rely on decisions by individuals and households. The report concludes that government must play a, more, a, a greater, more proactive role in encouraging greener behaviours. And it's calling on the Prime Minister urgently to set out a vision of a country in which low carbon choices and behaviours can flourish. But as we've seen, the Prime Minister's initial reluctance to sign off a modest £15 million information campaign to encourage people to conserve energy at a time where we face a national energy security crisis and the Treasury is, in, is investing billions to subsidize energy bills, doesn't bode well. Um, even if the Prime Minister has changed her mind about that particular campaign, there remains a deep reluctance within government to engage with the need for environmental behavior change. Over time, ministers have repeatedly refused to engage with calls for the public 
to adopt more climate friendly diets, eat less meat, drive less, fly less. But all of this is going to have to change. So one of the key conclusions from our first Pathways to Net Zero discussion series was that lack of leadership from central government is a major problem for local leaders trying to deliver net zero and deliver on their net zero targets locally. So today we will explore how we can develop an inspiring greener vision for the future we want that will help build the mandate for change and tough decisions for the long term. What would a sustainable, aspirational lifestyle look like? How can we move beyond the language of sacrifice and narratives of gloom and doom to engage people with a kind of inspiring vision for the future? And what, how do we want, what do we want our towns and cities to look like? And what do we need to do to bring that about? We need to consider how we can really empower our local leaders. You know, what support is needed for local councils? And critically, what are the conditions needed so that business and enterprise can play a vital role in driving forward the net zero transition. 84% of people are concerned about climate change. How can we build on this greater awareness on the issue? I mean, after a summer of record temperatures, hose pipe bans, fires, and at a time of escalating fuel and gas prices, surely now is the time for a concerted, um, education campaign for the public, awareness campaign, whatever campaign, to really drive home the importance, both the urgency of tackling the agenda, the benefits of, of, of a, a, taking action on climate change, and crucially how everyone can play their part. We need to treat people more like citizens. So how do we move away from a culture that is primarily focused on consumerism to one that recognizes our fundamental interdependence with each other and the biosphere. So these are just some of the questions that we will explore today. Thank you all very much for joining and I look forward to our discussion. Thanks, Julian. Thanks very much, Claire. Um, yes, um, you've captured all the, the important points there and the context. We need to see whether we can live up to that in our discussions now. And um, this, we have set ourselves really quite a challenge for, I would say, for this discussion. I mean, all of us here, we're aware of this urgency. We're aware of the scale of the challenge. Um, and we're acutely aware at any given point in time, and not least right now, of course, how the, the competing priorities of government, of business, of um, policies which, which run counter to what we're doing and the politics that run counter to what we're doing um, is, is the world that, that we're trying to sort of shout into at the moment. So we, we're all aware of that, but the, the purpose of today, and, and um, I find this very difficult because I can focus very much on the problems and not bring enough solutions to this discussion, but the the, what we really need to try and do um, is not so much uh, focus on why we're not doing things, but to talk about what can be done and how it can be done, um, because we can quite easily uh, talk about the solutions, but that's not, not the same as, as making things happen. And, but I don't want us obviously also to just sort of focus on the superficial idealistic ideas. Um, but I think the sorts of things that I would really like um, to, to see talked about is uh, that whether we like it or not, um, as, as Claire was saying a bit of, we, we behaviour is going to change. Uh, and what our jobs are is, is to, to uh, be able to communicate the fact that we're either going to be reacting uh, to, to uh, future events, uh, as we are now with a cost of living crisis, let alone any extreme weather events and so on that come down the line. How do we, how do we communicate the fact that whether we like it or not, we have got to change. We're either going to react and be made to change, or we need to change in order to protect us and be more resilient into the future. How do we inspire that vision, how do we communicate that trade-off 
um, and how do we get the mandate to be able to, to change now? So we're going to run the discussion. We're going to hear first of all from Peter Jones, who will who will um, who will um, set the initial flavour, um, and um, then obviously each of you on the call have been asked to to think about uh, the the sort of two three minutes that you'd like to to enter into the discussion with, and we will um, we we will take um, responses. Um, uh, as we go so so don't think that we're just going to have sort of one person the next person the next person without any interaction please um at any point if you've got something that you want to say in reaction uh to the discussion at that point do put up put up your hand then so um peter can i ask you to start and kick us off please thank you very much jenny and good morning everybody um let me talk a little bit briefly about some of the challenges and some of the opportunities i think um, I think the first thing to say is that uh, you know, the government is committed nationally to net zero carbon. There's more and more talk about the need for that. But exactly what it means for individual people's lives, I don't think has been fully worked out or fully communicated. Um, and certainly, until recently at least, um, the idea of increasing wealth, increasing happiness was very much tied up with increased material consumption. And obviously, that's an issue, not just in carbon, but also in terms of resources. Um, and so I think there is a need there for refocusing on if we're aspiring to better futures for all, what does that involve? And, and I guess there's two positives there. One is I think younger people in many cases are less focused on using material consumption as a measure of success. And secondly, life is becoming more digital and um, potentially that has less resource implications as well. So I think we are moving in, in the right direction there. Secondly, among transport professionals, I think there is a strong consensus about what sustainable mobility means. It means more walking, cycling, less car use, more public transport use. But I think two sort of issues there. One is that tends to have rather an urban focus. Um, if you live in semi-urban or rural areas, I think perhaps that hasn't been uh, as fully discussed as it might have done. That may be something Laurie will pick up on later on. Um, and secondly, I think the, the danger that's emerging now is with the electrification of the car fleet. Many people are thinking, right, job done. I've got my electric car, therefore I've solved the problem. And, and companies like Mercedes-Benz are promoting the idea of sustainable luxury, for example. Um, but of course, we know that that won't get us decarbonised quickly enough. And also there are other externalities, whether it's air pollution, congestion, traffic collisions that are not solved by, by simply electrification. So I think there's a bit of a health warning there. On the more positive side, um, I think there are three things going on. First of all, that um, transport is a right one. We have discussed this on the Green Transport Council before, and therefore it's decision made by other sectors, employers in relation to home working, NHS in terms of you know, doing remote appointments or localization of healthcare, et cetera, that has quite a major impact on, on travel behavior and therefore the opportunity to uh, use more sustainable modes by being able to walk and cycle to local facilities or do more things online. Um, and I think that's something where many sectors are now aligning and taking responsibility for the transport carbon emissions they generate. And that's a real opportunity to work together. Um, and in that way, because it's more comprehensive than just transport, it's likely to be more effective and be more accepted by people. Another thing, we're, we're awaiting new local transport plan guidance, which is due out fairly soon. Um, and my understanding is that will take much greater account of, of net zero and will recognize that not all problems can be solved in five years. And by only having a five year cycle, there's a risk that all the difficult ones get, get kicked down the road as it were. Uh, and that therefore it is necessary to look at a transition pathway from now to the end point and to make sure we schedule interventions at the right point and having a uh, local authorities, <coughs> excuse me, having a framework for doing that, I think will be very valuable. And then finally, just to keep it short, um, the key importance about pub the public, public dialogue and so on, as, as we heard from Claire, a lot of the changes need to come from individuals. And we know with the uh, disputes over things like uh, low traffic neighbourhoods, how contentious that can be. And I think, therefore, we have to go forward on, on a sort of co-creation basis, working with people about deciding how their local communities need to change. There was some very useful work done. I know Gillian was involved in looking at a, a national citizen's jury, but I think that sort of thing needs to be developed much further 
And if you look in the broader context about people's futures, they're concerned about their kids and grandchildren, I think there'll be much more willingness to look at how we can rearrange society in ways that are livable, sustainable, enjoyable, and, and also meet these targets. So I think much more opportunity from local authorities and all sorts of organizations to proactively work with different types of publics to deliberate and co-create the futures that we want. Thank you. Peter, thanks very much for that. I mean, that, so that's great. Three, you know, three areas of, 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 of how you see, where you see some, some positive or, or opportunity for positive development and actual positive developments. Can you take just a little bit more about the, the second point, this idea of, of having transition pathways that that you know reach out into the longer term um so so you're saying you're saying that that's what we need because you're absolutely right we do need we appreciate <coughs> all of us mm. here at least just how mm. urgent the next the next five years is but we do also need a longer term um transition pathway but how do you how do you see that working in reality for local authorities i mean many local authorities are setting out their 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 carbon budgets um uh, and and sort of picking dates in into the future to to be um carbon neutral etc uh, but what does that mean in reality in terms of what they can do and how they can how what they can put in place now to ensure um that that longer term vision okay well i, th I think there's two things um by mapping out the whole 30 years whatever uh, and actually seeing cumulatively what will or won't achieve zero carbon and there are some tools available to do that i'm involved in an eu project called sun plus where one of our colleagues has developed a little spreadsheet that will enable you to look at different strategies and see how far that will get you to zero carbon by 2050 for example um, and then we can identify what needs to be done in total see what is possible to do now in the next five years or so but I think the other important thing about that is to understand the things that can't be done now, why they can't be done now. Um, for example, it might be legislation. Um, and so that provides an opportunity by looking at that long-term pathway to actually, as I say, sort things into short-term, medium-term, long-term, where there are barriers to do the other things, to start lobbying now for legislation, et cetera, to make those things possible. And I think what's encouraging, looking beyond the UK, as you, I think most people are aware, in the in the European Union, there's a requirement for cities, or it will become a requirement for cities over 100,000 to produce a sustainable mobility plan. The EIB has just sponsored a new topic guide, which will be coming out later this month, on decarbonisation and carbon mitigation, in which they start off by talking about this, this 30, 20 or 30 year transition pathway, and to make sure that people, cities have a credible pathway to get there and to identify where the barriers are for some of those things so the EIB can lobby the European Commission whoever to make sure those barriers are removed in time to include those elements later on. So obviously not everything can be done now but I think by looking at the, um, at the whole thing, what can we do now, what needs to be done, when and what are the barriers that we can already anticipate. Um, I remember Bill Gates wrote a book a couple of years ago which I thought was interesting in that respect that um, you know, if you just focus on short term targets, you can make things worse off in the longer term. The example they gave in the States was a quick dash from coal to oil, uh, so, sorry, from coal to, to gas will get you part of the way in the short term. But then you're stuck because you've invested in a lot of stuff that won't get you the rest of the way. And therefore, it is important to, to set out that 20 or 30 year pathway. And I think that's something that perhaps we've not done in the past. We very much political reasons and funding reasons. We focused on what we can do in the short term. But a series of short term things won't get us there in the long term. I think the emphasis, I think, will be in the LTP and the emphasis that's certainly in this new European topic guide, I think, will help that reframing, which I think is crucial. And then just secondly, to, to how do you see that that relates to what you were saying in your in your third point mm -hmm. about sort of the public dialogue and, and how to actually have this conversation with the public? I mean, do you think that that long-term that pathway is is helpful, um, or does that also possibly bring a danger of for for individuals for, for for businesses who tend to to not be able to look into the future very easily? It could 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 it not have perverse impacts of of kind of kicking the ball down the road um, for them um, and and not seeing the the immediate urgency. 
Well, I think by looking at that longer term thing, you're showing the dangers of kicking the ball down the road uh, and or, or the impracticability of doing so because you just won't get to where you need to go. Um, as you say, businesses obviously are, are more focused on the shorter term, although for large companies, that's not necessarily true. I mean, a lot of international companies now um, are taking very seriously their commitments to get to zero carbon within the next 20 or 30 years and, and have programs to do that. Uh, and I think the World Business Council on Sustainable Development that has the top global companies there is taking very seriously that their members actually do use scope three accounting and actually have a, a long-term pathway to get to zero carbon. And I think a very interesting change, you know, you, you pick up sort of change, the winds of change as it were, BlackRock, which is I think one of the largest uh, private sector investment companies or hedge funds has actually said to its major companies that invest in, unless you have a strategy to zero carbon, we will de-invest in your sector because you won't have a long-term future. And I think those signals coming out from key players in the private sector is really quite influential. And then on the public side, I mean, clearly, at one level, we're all concerned about this year and next year. But I think that's overplayed. I think it's partly down to economics and consumerism. We're all told, of course, we're only concerned about the short term, aren't we? And everybody says, yes, of course, we'd rather have a pound this year than next year. And then you look at the way in which parents will sacrifice so their children have a better life than they do which doesn't seem to uh, fit with the idea we're always discounting doing things in the short term. So I think when we're dealing with the public, you know, the idea of what does this mean by children and grandchildren is, is perhaps a basis for having that longer term discussion. As well. and, and, and also what, what <coughs> strikes me as well, slightly different point, but I think one of the problems with the LTNs and the, and the kickback <coughs> that we've seen is that people don't see the bigger strategy and where that fits in to, to the bigger bigger picture, whether it's the bigger bigger picture in spatially acro- across um, the town well, and <clears throat> so on, or over the longer term and how it fits into it to a longer term strategy. So I, I would hope, um, I would think um, that, that having having those those transition pathways um, and, and seeing what how you know individual things in the near term then fit into that would be helpful um, as well. Temporary, but also spatially in, in the sense to show the jigsaw for the whole town or city yeah. or something like that. Yeah. I mean, I also wonder whether, I haven't had a chance to research this yet, but I mean, I wonder whether the re- variety of reaction to LTNs is partly to do with their detailed design, but also to do with where they're being implemented. I mean, for example, you know, there are cases like Wolf and Forest where after initial lot of opposition, people seem very happy with it now. And that centres around a local small high street, which has really come to life, more cafes. People now have a huge heart, new heart to their community. So they can see that by cutting back on traffic, they've regained a heart to the community. If your LTN is essentially just a regi- residential suburb, then maybe you don't see the benefits mm-hmm. of the gain. So I, I think we need to perhaps get better understanding of mm-hmm. what it is. Mm-hmm. Indeed, yeah, great. Wonderful, wonderful. wonderful. Uh, so um, thank you. At the, at the moment, I'm not seeing um, any hands up. So, um, oh, yes, I can actually. Ash- Ashok. Hi. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Gillian, thank you so much for, and uh, Claire for inviting all of us all to this uh, conversation, which I'm really looking forward to. We've got some amazing people around the table. So uh, may I offer a reflection on what's been said? Please do. So far. Okay. In, to introduce myself, I'm uh, Ashok Sinha. I'm the CEO of the London Cycling Campaign. So because I'm very happy to talk about LTNs in due course, but that's detail. I'm also the um, uh, chair of the London Sustainable Development Commission, which is an advisory, <clears throat> excuse me, advisory body to, in, independent advisory body to the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. So I think what I would like to do, and forgive me if I'm going slightly off piece here, is just make sure that I understand the framing of this conversation. So when we're talking about behaviour change, when we're talking about um, people's uh, individual lives, uh, why? Why are we talking about that? Um, Yes, it will have, by changing our lives, we will, and the way we go about our business, we will reduce our personal carbon footprints and that will be material. But um, individual action is not going to decarbonize the grid, it's not going to decarbonize gas, it's not going to decarbonize uh, industrial processes, it's not going to decarbonize any of the big ticket numbers. So for me, individual action has always been about creating a mandate, Claire, you used the word, political, opening up political space for politicians to step into. But that presupposes that they want to do that. 
And that's a really important distinction. Um, I just uh, like to just wave in front of the camera. You won't be able to see it. This is a book, uh, 2005, 2006, we, we produced this. I was the first director of the organization called uh, Stop Climate Chaos, which is now the Climate Coalition. And we had a campaign called I Count, and we tried to engage. We've got loads of people, 250,000 people engaging with it. Uh, all sorts of things that you can do to lower your carbon footprint. And at the back was a tear off stick to send to the prime minister saying, I want action. I'm doing my bit. I want action. Now, the reason why we did that was because this was pre this was pre uh, economic crash. This was during the time when we were talking about across and developing a cross party consensus, which I was involved in to create the Climate Change Act. The world was very different then. We now have a government that is non interventionist that does wants to expand oil exploration in the North Sea. And it's certainly not laying out the strategy, despite the many times, uh, being asked many times over the last 12 years that you were talking about, Gillian, the pathway, the strategy, and depend, depicting the picture of what our lives can and should be and how much better they should be. Now, it's, it, it, it's fine if, you, if you're um, relatively well off, if somebody comes to you and says, what do you want from your streets? Oh, well, I want clean air. I want uh, kids to be able to play out. I want it to be quiet. But where I'm sitting, I've got a housing estate right next to me in the middle of Lewisham. They want jobs. They want warm homes. They want skills and training for their kids. They want to be able to afford to get around. They want their amenities to be close to them. So when we're talking about the future we want, yes, Let's paint that picture. I'm always painting that picture. Because it's part and parcel of being a campaigner and trying to help people uh, engage with uh, a, a, a positive, aspirational, happy vision for a circular zero carbon economy. But right now and for a period of time, the engagement with people is going to have to be, in my view, more transactional. And it's going to be about getting them through the next five years. But framing that in such a way that says, but you know what, to get you through this next five years, we have to make some big changes to the way we organize our lives and our economy, which will lead to permanent changes. That will mean the economy will better be, be better for you, your, your uh, standard of living will be, 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 be better and costs will be lower and your kids will have jobs in the future. So for me, it feels more transactional than visionary. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I mean, you're certainly, as far as I'm concerned, completely, completely on the button. I will just say, though, that we're not we're not the purpose of today is not to just talk about um, how to inspire people, individuals. Um, it's about how we get this agenda and, and the visions of the future and the, the narratives actually um, uh, taken up by all the actors in the system. <laughs> So and I guess I'm just saying it's government. We, we, unless government I, is setting the agenda and the narrative, the describing narrative that we want, then think, none of this will happen. So I guess that's where I, I think that's right. And I, th I think that's right. So I, I, you know, I want us to talk about what what this narrative is, what the visions, what, what you know, how we can talk about this, and one. You know, everything that you said is true. We have to focus on the real issues of the day and what's of real concern, whether that's of, of real concern at the individual level or it is of real concern for the economy or whatever it might be. And, you know, there, there's many, much of this that, that does not require and is, is perhaps not necessarily a good idea to focus on on the climate and the carbon agenda at all. That might not be the way to do this, but that is precisely the kind of thing that, that we want to, to discuss. So, so thank you. Um, I'll, I'll move on. Um, so so move, us, move us down the list. Um, I think you've all got the, the list in front of you, so, so it'll be no surprise as to, as to who's coming next. So um, if we could have Bridget Smith, please. Thank you. Uh, so uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so I'm Bridget. I'm the leader of South Cambridgeshire District Council. It's a Lib Dem run council. Um, and we talk about ourselves as being green to the core. So when when I became the leader in 2018, I said I wanted South Cam's 
to be the greenest district council in the country. And, you know, we are, we're being really successful in that. So whilst appreciating uh, what was said about, you know, this is government's responsibility to step up and uh, and do stuff there are there are things that you know we we can do and in in local government i think it's often I think there's often a huge lack of awareness of, of what we can achieve. So, you know, there's, there's kind of three levels we work at. We can, we can put our own house in order. So I've invested three million pounds in turning my offices zero carbon. We are buying electric bin lorries as quickly as we can. There's not enough power in the grid. So we're building a solar farm to power the electric bin lorries. Uh, we're just the, all the one because we can't buy electric bin lorries because there's not enough supply. Uh, we're moving on to biofuels from all the other ones. All our other vehicles are electric. Um, so, you know, there's, there's stuff we can do. We have we have um, lots of council houses, about 6000. Uh, we've had a massive retrofitting campaign on those. But I think. One of the points that um, was just made that, you know, should we just be talking about, about climate and environment? And actually, I don't think we should, because what I always say is the we now have the cost of living crisis and we have a health and well-being crisis as well. And, you know, the pandemic really highlighted that. And I'd argue that all three are inextricably linked to each other. They all influence each other. So um, one of the ways that uh, we have huge um, ability to, um, to influence is through our local plan. So we're currently doing a joint local plan with Cambridge City because South Cambridgeshire wraps the whole way around the Cambridge City like a donut. And you know, this is a unique local plan because the whole plan is predicated on climate. Um, but you know, in order to make sure that uh, we are moving to net zero as quickly as we can, you know, we've got to start. We've got to start using spatial planning to help us achieve that. And obviously, transport goes some way to, to achieve that. But also, where we build houses and what sort of houses we build. So our, the new local plan, which has about you know close on fifty thousand houses in it um, up to twenty forty one, because we are one of the very highest growth areas in the in the country, and you know we're not seeing a slowdown in our economy. Actually, it, you know it's doing it's doing fine in, in South Cambridge and Cambridge City. But then you know it means there's a constant need for homes, and our house prices and our rents are unaffordable to uh, to most most people. Um, so you know we're not building houses in the countryside. We are only building houses in uh, in strategic sites, whereas there is the very best in public transport. Uh, but also, the whole we're we're very wedded to the sort of fifteen minute city uh, philosophy. So the idea is that you can get anywhere you want. You can certainly get from your home to your work, uh, you know, in fifteen minutes, either on sustainable transport or on public transport. Um, ideally, you can get to your education, to your healthcare, to to, to your leisure as well. So we're currently building three new towns in South Cambridgeshire. North Stowe's the largest new town since Milton Keynes. And, you know, these towns can't be dormitories. They've got to be self-contained entities where people can choose to, to live and work. So we've inherited a real disconnect between um, our housing runs east-west and our jobs run north-south. We have all, you know, these biomedical sites and, and so on, um, but everybody commutes into them. So, you know, it's, it's very difficult in this area to get people out of their cars. And I live in um, a village right in the sort of on the Bedfordshire border and there's no public transport and I have no choice but have a car. So um, you know, we've got to make sure that we are we are building communities where not only is car ownership not necessary, we take that extra step to actually making it undesirable. So when I lived in London, owning a car was definitely undesirable. So I didn't own a car when I was there. And, you know, we've got to start rolling that model out in rural areas as well. So, you know, our local plan is probably our most powerful tool to, uh, you know, to start addressing the, our dependency on cars and our carbon emissions are 25% above the national average here. And that's all because, you know, we have, we have lots of vehicles. Um, but also when, when we're planning for housing, if we start, we have to start building housing that's affordable for people to live in. So, you know, if we include, you know, the highest in energy efficiency standards, renewable energy, 
re re remove the reliance on cars and the need to own cars. So, you know, we give people the opportunity to, to grow their food and so on. Suddenly we start affecting the pound in their pocket as well. So suddenly we start making it cheaper for them to live here. And though I have no control over, you know, mortgages and house prices, I can insist that we build houses that are cheaper to run and for people people to live in. So, you know, we have to start thinking about the affordability, not just of buying or renting houses, but the affordability of actually living in those houses as well. And then also factored into this is all the sort of health and well-being. So if, if through local planning, we are creating you know, ready access to well-managed public green and blue, blue space to keep people active. And we know this from COVID. We know those communities which were active fared, be fared better. So we have to start building resilience into, into our planning so that people are healthier. And, you know, if and when another pandemic ha happens, actually, you know, everybody can get out of their houses, they can exercise, they can meet up safely. So, you know, we are the I think we're the first local authority that has done a call for green sites in our local plan as well. And that's all tied into a very long conversation about um, biodiversity net gain, which we're aiming for 20%. And then there's also all, all the roles we have in partnerships. So we have a, a mayoral led combined authority here, and I lead on the environment for that. And we also have a half billion pound city deal called the Greater Cambridge Partnership. Um, and I'm on the board for that as well. And the Greater Cambridge Partnership is all about the modal shift. It's about reducing congestion, improving air quality, reducing carbon emissions, and giving every single person in South Cambridgeshire ready access to the very, very best in public transport. And we're doing that. I, I could talk for the rest of your session on that, but I think that probably gives you, gives you a bit of an overview. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks very much for that. And uh, there are some really great things going on in, in Cambridgeshire. Can I just ask you, a, a, um, I guess, sort of to dive into that in a specific way, which is just to do you have any thoughts about how this has worked so far with large housing developers? I mean, we talk about obviously government as being a huge actor and so on, but one of the, the big actors in, in precisely what you're, you're saying is developers, and they need to be sold the vision of denser housing developments um, and uh, not, not so much space allocated to, to car parking, et cetera. Is, have you got any thoughts on how that has worked and what the incentivization yes. process has been? I, I do. Um, so, I mean, you know, the frustration is that we need government to legislate, to, you know, to make every house include renewable energy. You know, why does every loo not flush with rainwater? It's so cheap to install at outset. You know, it's really, you know, it's really easy to do. So we do need, we do need government, government to start forcing the hands of developers. However, you know, we work very closely with developers in South Cambridgeshire, and you know, we are we are now delivering. Um, you know, communities where, you know, they are, things are going up now in, in Cambridge. If you look at the Water Beach development, uh, you know, that's probably going up to about 13, store, 13 stories. So, you know, we are seeing an urbanization of, our de of, of developments because our land, our land values are so, are so high. Um, Eddington, which is a big development led by the university, primarily to you know house university people. Again, is you know that's probably it's about six sto six stories. So you know, developers are you know they are talking about that. We need. What really frustrates me on smaller developments is that there's always the offer of including renewables and so on. But, you know, it's optional for people and, you know, that, that's difficult. You know, we need all this stuff fitted as a matter of course, you know, as you would put a roof on a house. So we need that there to be rainwater recycling and photovoltaics as standard. We've got to stop these things being optional extras. Um, but one thing I'm doing practically to try and help this is that I have a joint venture with a developer and we're building out our first site, which is actually opposite my offices in Camborne, which is another new town. So we're just currently building 265 houses. 40% um, of those will be affordable houses, all built, and those will be in my ownership, and those are all going to be zero carbon. Um, and, you know, they are going to include, you know, 
everything to make cycling easier and better. Camborne's a great place for cycling, but make it easier still. You can grow your vegetables there. So, you know, we're using that our own housing stock as an exemplar. And this is going to be a really exemplar little development. And I'm taking a big hit on my profit um, because that, this matters so much to me. And then, you know, hopefully I can take developers there and go, look, this is fabulous. And actually, you know, you need to think about your marketing. This is what people want. So, you know, we've got to get to the point where actually people want to not just live in houses that look lovely, you know, the government's building beautiful stuff. They've got to be cheaper to run. People begin, you know, do care about the environment, but they've also got to benefit people's health and well-being. So it's those three factors we need to be talking about together and stop talking about the environment in isolation. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, uh, there is a question in the chat and it was one that I was I was thinking of about about how um, you are leading on the discussion about having road pricing and I know that Cambridgeshire you've had you know your own citizens journeys and reconvene journeys I'm not going to ask you to comment on that just now because we're going to run out of time but if, if there's an opportunity in the chat. to come back in okay. thank you that's brilliant um, okay um, next up is Kamal all right thanks Julian well I'm just thinking um, best thing is probably by follow Councillor um, Smith actually because I think she's already laid out like the sorts of things that are in the arts of the possible at the local level um, and I don't actually live a million miles away from uh, South South Cambridgeshire um, up in the north north end of uh, Cambridgeshire Councillor Smith a uh, village called Yaxley you may know it well I don't know <laughs> like, um, but um, there's certainly a lot, I think, that councils and local authorities can already do, particularly to around um, looking at transport, around managing traffic demand, things like using parking policy, bus prioritisation, clean air zones. There's things like workplace parking levies exist, congestion charging has, has been discussed in, in, in Cambridge. Um, we've now got moving traffic uh, enforcement powers. Um, also, how you can use spatial planning powers as, uh, uh, as well. Um, and there's there's probably lots of other things that we we, we can do as, as well. Some may require um, uh, government approval, but others I think we can get on and do a lot of them. So question therefore is then why, why doesn't this happen everywhere? Um, and of course, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of issues there why, in, in terms of why that doesn't happen. So um, Ashok touched on it before, it's around willpower. Um, you know, not everywhere may want to do this and recognise the importance of doing this. There's lots and lots of trade-offs at a local level. Um, a lot of this isn't within, you know, these are not statutory duties um, for, for, for local authorities. So when you're faced with um, other pressures, um, remember councils provide around, I think, at least 700 services, depending on what definition you, you, you use. Lots and lots of competing demands on, on, on local authorities. Um, but I think most places do recognise that that they need to act on um, on on decarbonisation, for example, um, and it's it's therefore you know may have the willpower. But obviously, then that willpower varies in how, how how strong it is, and how do you affect how do you affect that change in willpower? Well, you either it either comes from your your people, your residents, your businesses, from the opposition. Um, it can come from neighbouring authorities, or it can come from the government. Um, so there's a number of places where you can look for sources of, of, of sort of influence in terms of uh, pressures on, uh, uh, from, from local on local leadership. Um, but you also need uh, resources. Um, and I think it's worth just setting out the sorts of pressures that local government is, is under at the moment. So um, so when councils were starting to set their budgets for for, for this for this year, Inflation was expected to be 4.4% in this financial year. So since then, obviously, we've had energy price increases, spiral inflation, things such as national living wage um, pressures, they all add to um, council's uh, budget. So our analysis in the year showed these factors led to about £2.4 billion in extra cost pressures for this year alone, and a potential funding gap next year of £3.6 billion, and then £4.5 billion year after. Um, and since we published our analysis, inflation has risen even further to 9.9%, and the Bank of England uh, predicts this will be around 13% uh, later on, on this year. And this is resources important, because without resources, we can have all the tools and the policy levers in, in place, but if we don't have the bombs on seat 
and the expertise to actually bring all of these tools together and to make use of them, then it, a little bit pointless. So, so it, we don't have teeth to affect affect change. So there's a lot of factors that need to come together at that local level. And, and the trouble is in most years, we don't tend to have all of those running together. Um, and and that's and that's a that's a difficulty. Um, and funding isn't just about the here and now, it's long-term certainty of funding, the ability to actually properly plan ahead, to bring in partners, both private sector and, and the public sector partners, you know, to be able to influence the likes of um, network rail and, and, and the rail industry, to be able to influence the likes of Highways England, you know, organizations which have often been notoriously difficult to engage with and to influence. Um, you need that sort of long-term certainty. Um, you know, th those those agencies get five-year funding settlements, um, but local government doesn't. Um, and and all our, you know, I think one year we, we cal calculated there's about 11 different funding pots for roads alone. That's no way to sort of manage, um, you know, infrastructure. After all, you could argue it's one big infrastructure, isn't it, across the country? So um, with lots of interdependencies, so I, I'm afraid a lot of it does go back to having uh, resources um, and also long term funding allows um, investment to take place in people and skills as well. Um, short term funding, um, for example, if you look at highways maintenance and the predicament that lots of authorities are in, you know, they do a lot of things like spot pricing and, and things like that, and short term contracts. They don't encourage um, uh, the, the private sector suppliers to in, invest in things like local people or local depots, et cetera, local supply chains. Um, so, you know, um, but, you know, if you look at the rail industry with the long-term plans and, and national highways, they are able to do that because they've got that long-term funding and surety in, in place. So um, I'll, I'll nearly stop there. And, and the, I mean, I think what, what councils can do, apart from you know having some of those tools, is, is getting trying to get those basics right around sort of maintenance of road, um, you know, using existing tools, park and ride schemes, but also little things like thinking about looking at um, your, your car parks, for example. Are there are there walking maps on your car parks? Um, just little things like that to encourage. Um, more sort of active travel and 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 uh, and bits and sort of behaviour change at that sort of local level. I think I'll stop there. Thanks, Kamal. I, I I wanted to ask you a question. I mean, do you think that you know the experience of COVID um, at least uh, managed to highlight uh, uh, what what we mean by key services uh, for public transport, particularly for local bus services? I mean, is is your sense that that that's already you know been uh long forgotten um or has that changed anything has that changed anything in terms of the the local priorities the local dialogue has it changed anything between you know local authorities and central government um as as far as um uh, you know do, do you see that the social value if you like of pub local public transport um has been elevated in in any way well um it's a really, really tricky one because I think at the local level, if you look at um, um, buses, uh, for example, then, um, you know, they're, they're still hovering around, I don't know, I mean, Anthony will probably have better figures, but, you know, the 80, 85% mark in lots of places um, and, um, you know, lots of sort of um, older people, concessionary fares, fares using people have, have stayed away from using those either because of um, health reasons or they've found other means. Of, of, of doing uh, doing this, just, just, or just scared of using public transport, so um, it's a difficult one. And yet, we look at buses, and, and I think and, and local government recognises buses as still part of that important mix in decarbonising and reducing uh, decarbonising the way we, we we travel and reducing demand for for, for cars. Um, so I think it's still it's still um, there. It's still important. Um, but we're having to almost start again from a different different base, I think. And I think the other thing is not to forget, I think, the, the growing importance of other shared means of travel as well. So we look at public transport perhaps a bit too narrowly, that, you know, should we be looking at other means of, of shared transport as, as, a, as a sort of a public transport? I'm even looking at micro-mobility, e-scooters, e-bikes, 
um, and um, um, you know car clubs, those sorts of things. Um, you know, it, it doesn't have to be in that sense that the public transport in the way we recognise, but it's about um, you know perhaps some different modes which are better suited to to, to some places and perhaps um, a bit more affordable in, or, or, um, in terms of the public purse as well. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much. Okay, um, no hands up at the moment, so we'll move on and move on to Anthony. Anthony Smith, please. Thank you. Yes, can you hear me okay? Everyone at that end, I had a bit of IT trouble yeah. earlier on. Thank Great. Good. Um, good morning, everybody. Anthony Smith, um, Chief Executive for Transport Focus with the Independent Consumer Watchdog for Britain's Transport Users. Um, I'm speaking to you today from an office, remember those places, and um, just to give a bit of context. And just to be clear, Transport Focus is unashamedly a pure consumer organisation. So I think this discussion about the consumer versus the citizen will continue right through this um, this morning. And I think it was interesting what Ashok said about you know the transactional nature of some of this stuff as opposed to some of the big government stuff. You know, do we focus on helping people to make the right decisions, or is it up to government, or is it a bit of both? Um, I'd like to make a few points, one of which is I think it's the, the tone of this debate is terribly important. I thought, Bridget, what you said was absolutely brilliant. It was really inspirational. It was positive. You're driving change. You're making things happen. You're making people's lives better today. I am moving. I'm packing my bags. I'm coming up to you wherever you are. It's, it just sounds great. Uh, it's really positive. And I think the, the tone of this debate is so important. If we get into kicking, kicking, kicking government, government just stops listening. I mean, they're doing a very good job today of kicking themselves. They don't want anyone else to be kicking them and I think the tone of this is so crucial we've got to find good practice we've got to praise people we've got to highlight it I remember when my dad started his career in central London he, he watched the day they commissioned Bankside power station you know the day it started belching fumes into the air can you believe that it's just sort of that's gone we have cleaner air in London it's a big success let's praise these things we've got to we've got to help people cheer up a bit because the narrative of gloom is just awful because you just want to kill yourself because it's all so terrible. And I know there are huge problems. I know there are huge issues, but we've got to get onto a positive footing, I think, about some of the narrative. And as a consumer organisation, we therefore very much see it as our job to help people make, inverted commas, the right decisions. Nudge help them, small changes, help people on the journey. Big changes are scary, just nudge people forwards. And I think that's very much what we want to see because all of us, all of our research, when you boil it down to its absolute essentials, everybody makes their decisions about how to travel through a mixture of cost, trading off cost and convenience. And there's a sub elements of choice and control as well, but it's really cost and convenience. That's what drives your sort of transport choice. And the fact is, once anybody's bought a car outside of zones, probably one, two and three in London, once you've bought a car, you're pro it's the default way to get round. We've spent 100 years planning our societies round we wheelie things with rubber wheels and people like them. You know, people love them. Of course they do. They're incredibly convenient. And the petrol price spike we saw recently, there was no discernible drop in car use throughout the whole petrol price spike that tells you just what people are prioritizing in their lives because outside of central london people have built their lives around cars and we all rely on trucks by the way everything in this office came on a truck without the trucks moving around at the moment we're going nowhere as any sort of society so i think ultimately again you just do come back to these debates about the future about how as bridget brilliantly said about planning how you get planning focused on giving people opportunities to make the right choices and about how you in the in the shorter term how we think very deeply about how we pay for our roads and how to use our roads and after years of thinking about this, no matter how much behaviour change stuff you do, how much you try and nudge people into more sustainable forms of transport, it's only going to make an incremental difference at the margins. We did a bit of work about what would happen if you made um, public transport, local public transport in West Yorkshire effectively free, so a pound a month, say. And 
the modal shift was about 10%. So you've got 10% of people shifting towards public transport for their journeys. You get some unintended consequences because people think, oh, the bus is virtually free and might as well use it rather than walking, which is not a good thing. And the amount of subsidy needed to run the local public transport network almost doubles. So you're left with 90% of the car use, even if you make public transport virtually free. That is the scale of the issues we're looking at in terms of how we pay for our roads and how we pay for using our roads, which actually potentially are two quite different things. And I think the one thing we've just got to remember is events will drive change. Remember last summer, we are in for more bouts of protracted extreme weather, especially heat. And the heat apparently is more predictable than the rain. And all the meteorologists seem to be saying that hot is big. The world, you know, Britain is going to get hotter and the periods of heat are going to get longer. It was awful last summer. If that happens again and it's hotter and it's longer, government literally has to respond it has to do something because local pressure will drive it and what are they going to do they're going to have to think very deeply about making public transport more accessible and more affordable potentially and they're going to have to think very deeply about making car use less accessible and more expensive because if they don't this country is simply not doing its bit and i think that's the sort of macro thing. And don't ever forget local pressure. Putney High Street was a disaster zone because of the buses and traffic piling up and down it. Sadiq, the mayor, had to do something about it because local people were saying our kids at primary schools one road away from Putney High Street are being choked to death, literally. Something happened. Electric buses going up and down there. It makes a difference. So I think let's not underestimate how much events are going to drive things. Thank you very much. Anthony, thank you. And I, um, I I'm, I'm in a dilemma here because I don't, I don't want to, um, uh, to be seen to, to reverse this idea of a positive tone. However, <laughs> um, uh, I've got, I've got a sort of, uh, a challenge back to you because I think in some ways there's a contradiction in, in what you say in, uh, because unless I've, you know, I, I might be scrambling this, but you know, you're sort of talking about the, the fact that big, big changes are scary and we've got to nudge people on the one hand, but on the other hand, we've got to make um, that, that, that just nudging people don't only gets changes at the margins. So I, 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 I how, you know, what was it that, that you use, you think can be used to square that circle? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's quite right to point out the contradiction. What I'm saying because it is it is riddled with contradictions, which I think this whole issue is. To be honest, um, all I know is that I, my ability to influence things in China is relatively limited. I have noticed. Therefore, if they choose to burn coal, it's quite difficult to exert pressure on to do something about it. Um, I think the nudge has got to come in the areas where it's going to make most of a difference and. I think the, how we pay for road use is key in that, the nudges involved in that. And we haven't even really started that debate yet in this country. It, it, it's going to come. How we pay for flying is really, really interesting because the problem is that most surveys, you know, if you ask people, do you want to save the planet? There's very few people are going to say, nah, not really. Or, you know, somebody else can sort that out. It's all a bit tricky. And then you ask, so people say, yes, I'm going to save the planet. Right. Where are you going on holiday this year? Spain. How are you going to get there? I'm going to fly. Right. It's kind of it, there's masses of contradictions packed into this. And unless we look at how we pay for flying as well and the amount we pay for flying, there's no way, you know, we're going to shift the dial on some of this stuff. So I think there's got to be an absolute mixture here of real micro stuff about low traffic neighborhoods, offering people local choice, better walking. The most marginalized group of transport users on the planet are pedestrians. They get shoved around by everybody else. And because of the diffusion, the absolute local diffusion of their interest, it's virtually impossible to represent them. You, we, you, we virtually rely on councils to do it and nobody else. And boy, if there was an effective way of representing Trump and pedestrians, I'd love to know how to do it. And we would like to do it. But it's a real shame because they're so important 
important. And I think so it's the real mic local micro, low traffic neighbourhoods, better walking. I think the government has to think and, go, and local governments probably have to think about how we pay for our roads. I think national government's going to duck this. I think Peter is absolutely right, is that the pressure on clean air zones will force change in certain areas, which is really good. And then ultimately, the big government has to do something to think about, you know, pricing on the strategic road network and about the price we pay for um, air transport. So, yes, it is really with contradictions but you know i think we all contain these contradictions inside ourselves i you know i want to fly less does that stop me flying completely no it hasn't sorry <laughs> great okay thank you and sorry to to come back at you with 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 the uh the, no, yeah, no with that, that. <laughs> that is your job as chair and i, I i'm my thinking on this virtually evolves every week and that's why the green transport council is so such a good uh, forum and because to have this range of experts and to hear from them is just amazing i think that's right and i think if we're not honest about the contradictions either we're, we're not gonna win win the hearts and minds you know uh, uh, where we need to um i'm gonna bring ali clayburn in next so slightly jumping out of order because unfortunately he's got to leave us at 11 and we definitely want to hear what he's got to say so um ali Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I'm absolutely loving this, and I don't want to miss a second, but I'm sorry, I've got to be gone at 11. Um, um, so the whole focus of this, um, in terms of inspiring people, absolutely behind it, loving what I've heard so far. Um, our focus is very much on a very uh, small bit of uh, the transport world in terms of the commute. Um, and our, we've completely reframed our vision to, met, to be around making zero carbon commuting a reality. So we've moved away from historically just focusing on the uh, lift sharing side of our work to being all around the commute. And it has inspired me, it's inspired my team, and it's inspired our clients. And our engagement now with clients, because we're focusing on the zero carbon commuting side, has, has gone through the roof. That side of the business has, has gone uh, very large because um, of the way we've approached it. So uh, the commute is the single largest source of emissions um, in the UK. It accounts for 5% of all emissions. That's 18 billion kilos. And for me... Unless we decarbonise the commute, we will fail our net zero goals. And if we do that, our children will not forgive us. And that inspires me to do more. Talk about the short term, long term. I want to leave this place better for my kids. The really exciting thing, having got under the cover of this, is that the commute may be the, the least efficient journey we do, but it could be changed overnight through behaviour change. Because we've analysed over half a million commutes and... Um, to give you one example of a hospital we were looking at last week, currently at the hospital, 7% of their staff walked, 13% could. 5% uh, cycled, 39% could. 2% lift shared, 95% could. 1% travel by bus and 55% could. So these services are available right now. You don't need the adoption of EVs. You don't need any of that tomorrow to get this, this shift to happen. You just need policies in place to encourage that shift across and to motivate people and inspire people. And what we found is by um, assessing what people want to do and how they can do it, and then putting those options in front of them, the adoption has been super quick. We've also found that by putting the data in front of transport providers like Stagecoach, Zelo, National Express, they've put in new bus services to these sites based on the demand for that data. So. For us to change um, a nation's travel habits and make zero carbon commuting, we need to focus on individuals and give them better options and show that they are more convenient and they are uh, uh, often far cheaper too. Um, so we need to inspire them. This whole thing around language is completely true. In my experience, it's action that drives belief rather than belief driving action. And it's data that drives action. So for action to happen, you need three things. You need an option, you need a better option that's there. You need um, awareness that that option exists. And that's a real issue with this sector. So we, people just don't know what options are out there. And you need the audience to perceive that that option is worth trying at least once. They've got to perceive it's worth trying. Once they've tried it, if it is better and cheaper, more convenient, they will keep using it because they're not stupid. But at the moment, they don't perceive that those options are either there or better. So that's what we've got to do. We've got to get them in, get the, the options in front of people. Um, so the trick is about getting people to try it, whether that's trying out lift sharing for the first time or whether it's about an employer running a travel survey for the first time. We've got to show that running a travel survey is going to be good for them and they're going to want to do it again. Um, creating a better future for uh, my children really does inspire, inspire me, but telling people to share cars and create a be better future for their children is not necessarily the answer. We have to show people, we have to engage with people, we have to get them doing it. And in our experience over the last few years, 
by doing that, we've we've achieved some amazing results that could be done anywhere. So I would go right back and say, let's start with start with the data, get people to try things, and then once they try them, then, then move forward because the potential is right there. We can if we can get our the average commuter in the UK at the moment emits 850 kilos of carbon. We could get that down to 300 in a year, or probably tomorrow, just by shifting people across to the options that are available to them right now. So let's not think this is hard or impossible that we have to rely on EVs or anything, because we can't and they won't make a difference anyway. Um, let's focus on behaviours and focus on, it. in our case, we, we focus on employers to be the kind of medium to get through to, to people. Thank you. I think that's really positive. Um, what I want to ask you is, I mean, you, 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 you talk there about the need to um, uh, focus on the individual, but actually, in reality, what you're doing, what Mobility Ways are doing is focusing first and foremost on the employers, right? So yeah. can, you, can you just say a little bit about that? I mean, what, what actually sells this idea to them? What, what are they really believing is in it for them to get their, their, their employees to change behaviour because they don't have any responsibility for, for that part of the carbon equation? Uh, that's a really uh, good question. And again, it goes down to um, making it super easy and clear to them. So when they see a scoping report that shows that 55% uh, of their staff could be going by bus, but only 1% currently are, they start asking questions about why is, why is that happening? Surely there's a better way. So you, you make it blindingly obvious for them to, to get interested in this. And it's the senior stakeholders at these employer sites that whether they're doing it for a staff retention recruitment thing, or whether it's about the environment or whether it's about cost saving, if you give them really clear data, they can make really quick decisions. And we took a team of um, civil servants up to Prologis at Durft uh, a couple of months ago, uh, take six civil servants there. They went there, they saw what was happening and the pace of change that's being adopted and how Stagecoach were introducing new routes, Zillow putting new routes, they're about to adopt a huge lift share scheme across the whole site, Sainsbury's and all the big um, people there. And, and then the DFT team go back and basically say, how can we replicate this elsewhere? By showing them what's working on the ground, they got really excited. Um, but if they hadn't been there, they wouldn't really believe it possible because they live in the Westminster Bowl. OK, great. And we've got a couple of questions for you, which is great before you leave. So I'm not sure who was first, but Anna, would you like to go first? Thanks, Gillian. Um, I also just wanted to check you didn't forget me, Gillian, because you skipped over me on the list. And I, was I, I, I know <laughs> I I um I have definitely haven't forgotten you. Um, sorry, I went I went to Ali because he's got to leave at eleven. Sorry. That's okay, no worries. I did have a question for Ali. It's <laughs> awesome. Um, <laughs> um, just to say, Ali, like I think that's like really inspiring. Your shift in kind of yeah tackling commuting as a whole. Um, are you also planning to do this with things like school travel and weekend travel? Because I feel like these are also the kinds of journeys. Well, not just school, but like wider people ferrying their kids around. Um that can think can hold people hostage to the car and I find the most ironic thing now I'm finding is people the the reason people say they get a car is because they have kids and I'm like this is so like backroads because like you say you know you want to make create a better world for your kids they may have a better life in the short term but by buying a car when you get a family you're actually like worsening their chat I just think it's so weird so yeah do you have any thoughts on that yeah the school run is very similar to the commute and they are intertwined so one of the key challenges during lockdown was that uh, parents are driving their kids to school, turning around and going home and working at home, uh, which is just is crazy. So um, linking school run, yes, uh, we're just doing our first couple of pilot projects with um, schools using the exact same methodology of let's work out where parents are coming from, work out how to do it better. And actually, in one interesting case, looking at um, three schools provide their own school buses, but they all work independently and they will only have two or three people on them. Why not all combined buses provide more routes, more coming in from more places, make better use of the assets and bring all the children into the three different schools rather than doing it all separately. So it is, it's all doable. It's just uh, trying to do it as fast as possible on limited resources. Great. Thanks, Anna. And uh, you are you are next. <laughs> but Peter, would you like to, to ask your question? Well, just a quick comment on what you said, actually, Gillian. You said, why should employers do this? Because it's not their problem. <clears throat> That's not actually quite true. I mean, employers that are doing scope three accounting include the commuting CO2 of their employees as part of their CO2 emissions. And the car and the CO TBI about 18 months ago produced a report saying that employers should do this and they should take responsibility for it. So at least among certain large employers, there is an acceptance of some responsibility, which obviously helps Ali in his mission. Yeah. No, I agree. Of... Thank, thanks for clarifying that. But it, the, I guess the point is that the scope three emissions are not yet um, mandatory, mandatorily right. um, 
their responsibility. So, but they, yeah, thank you. They do they, they do need to be because it's for some of the they companies we can look at it. It's thirty percent of their total emissions comes from commuting, which is just crazy, and they weren't previously reporting on it at all. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks very much, Ali, and, and very sorry that you have to leave us. So am I. Okay, Anna, we'll, we will come to you now, please. <laughs> Thanks, Gillian. Um, okay, I'm going to do my best at talking slower than I usually would because I get really excited and like rattle away. So um, I wanted to focus, um, I mean, on so many different things, but I'm going to try and weave, weave them into one succinct, hopefully three minutes speech. Um, I wanted to focus on what a successful vision is because Gillian, I know it was one of your questions and clear that you had about visioning. And it's something I do in my day-to-day -day life is help with visioning. Um, so one of the things I wanted to pull out is an example of like a really, really good vision that you'll all know very well already, which is Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream um, kind of oration that he did. It's very famous for a very good reason, because it is an absolutely epic vision that I think we can all learn from how to do visioning very well. He sets out, I think, three components, like essential components to any vision, which is the reality. And actually, a picking up on the points, you know, about various things but that we mentioned about how grim the situation is right now, I actually think it's important to focus on the reality of where we are now and kind of just be real about it and be honest about it. So being real about where we are now, but being very visionary and not held, you know, too much to the realities of now and where we want to get to, you know, we always get so hung up on what's possible and what's not possible. And that's point what's come to in a second. So where do we want to get to? Where do we really want to get to? What's our dream? Like we can dream, we can have, we can use the word dream. We don't just have to use the word vision. And I think the third and probably most important um, part is how some ideas, at least just some ideas of how to get there um, and the kinds of things that we might do to bridge the gap from where we are, the reality of where we are now, to the dream we want to get to. What kinds of things will get us towards that dream to help us achieve that dream? And I was reflecting on, so I am currently in Scotland and I took the trains, the, the trains to get here, I did split ticketing, had like a million tickets, had a million trains and I was like reflecting on my first train and I was in a great mood, I was like, oh, trains, having a great time and I wrote I saw this video that someone had posted and it kind of spurred me to think about like in my head, I think I do live in a dreamland that does not exist. And I think I always have <laughs> been, you know, I've been born into the third and fourth industrial revolutions where we're supposed to be all techie and we're supposed to be, you know, living in the virtual world. And I look around and I see this world full of these massive big machines that feels very dystopian to me at times. And I don't know why more people don't live in my little dreamland with me in my public transport, without my car, without, you know, walking everywhere. Cause it's a amazing in my head and then reality hit me yesterday which I'll explain in a second but I was just thinking about some of the things for me like in my little dreamland for me it's the random acts of kindness I experience when I'm on public transport when I'm walking down the street the smiles people give for example or just you know offering to help take my put my bag up on the rack for me yesterday being around the quiet or noisy comfort of being around other people, um, the fresh air and the exercise I get between each mode of transport I take, the sense of freedom and carefreeness I experience on a daily basis. I genuinely feel so carefree. I don't have to worry about being tied to a big metal machine and where it is and if it's been vandalized and how much it's costing me. I just don't have to care. Um, the ability the ability to do useful things with my travel time when I get on the train, the bus, whatever you all know, we all we can do what we want to. Um, the spontaneity of what the world throws at me when I'm out and about, you know, I'm not stuck in my own little map box. I'm not, you know, I'm I'm there, I'm in the world, I'm floating around, playing a part in it. It feels amazing sometimes. Um, and only paying for what I use during the pandemic, my travel costs were squilcho like I did not pay very much because I wasn't going anywhere you know paying for what you use is something that's so like that's a dream to me if we can live in a world where we pay for what we use instead of having these massive costs that kind of weigh us down and that sunk cost and um, that we often talk about I think um yeah I think more people if more people kind of lived in my dream world they'd also feel like it was a dream world and then my first train was an hour late and reality hit me and I and I heard people say, oh, this is the first time I've got the train in three years. I'm definitely taking my car next time. And the harsh reality of where we are now hit me like a slap in the face. And I got caught in Carlisle for an hour and it was I made some friends, though. That was the good side. That was the dream or the dream part. <clears throat> but then it got me thinking about and one of the most inspiring things anyone's ever said to me was Martin Revel. He said everything is made up like we've literally made up our entire world. Everything we see all the processes we follow, all the tools we use, it's all made up. We have the power to shape the future we live in. We have the power to achieve our dreams. If we set them out clearly, we can change things. And I think that, 
you know, for me, I started thinking about, you know, what should we be? Should instead of a transport planner, should I be a system planner? Should we be involving way more people in our view of how society moves forward, how we can move away from quite an isolated way of living that we've ended up in? And the kind of grim reality that we're in. So how can we like reimagine the entire way that society functions? Because transport is just a part of that. It's not the be all and end all. Um, so yeah, it's me. Anna, thanks so much. I mean, I know you end ended there by, um, you know, a little bit by sort of saying, you know, we 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 have we might have dreams and visions, but we often have to be brought down to earth with a bump. Um, but I think, you know, some of the comments already this morning have been about how we uh, there are there are pockets of success. There are things to point to and that it is necessary to point to where it is um, is happening, is working well, you know, where we can show the way, I think was, was the phrase. I mean, does that is that something that you that, that you, um, you know, bring it into you because I know you do the visioning scenario work I mean how how do you how do you look at where success is happening and kind of bring that in into the visioning yeah I mean um it's interesting actually um the projects I'm working on at the minute we're looking at like case studies from across um, England. Uh, this is an LGA project, Kamal, I won't mention any more about it. But um, yeah, we're looking at like how we learn from each other and how we learn from case studies, successful case studies. So yeah, of course, it's definitely something that we can bring in and inspire people. And I think there's little things we see in our daily lives that are part of, you know, the vision we want to see. Like I was saying, like, my, you know, the smiles you get in the street from people. And like, that's that's the world I live in, in my head. And when you do visioning, um, yeah, there's definitely things you can pull on and you need to point to some kind of reality and where things have worked well to say, oh, look at that. The pandemic's a good example, actually, of the quietness of the streets and, you know, the way we could just walk around without being worried about getting flattened by a car without the din of noise and we could hear the birds, you know, that, that in itself was a vision. <laughs> um, so, yeah, definitely pulling, pulling parts of reality in, yeah. Okay, well, look forward to that that LGA work because I do, um, you know, I do think it's necessary for us to, you know, keep a, a, a constant stock uh, up our sleeve and and be able to point to the the good these good examples. So thank you. Okay, um, I know there's there's sort of some commentary and so on going on in the chat. I'm I'm sort of got a, a bit of an eye on on that, but I'm I'm not going to be bringing those things in specifically. But do do keep that going if if that's useful. Um, we'll carry on with the discussion and um, over to Yuman Sadiq. Uh, yes, hi everyone. Good morning. Um, and yeah, thank you to Julian, Claire, and Claudia for having me here. And thanks to Anna just now. I thought that was great. <laughs> um, so just to introduce my very, uh, myself very quickly, I'm a policy manager at Energy UK, uh, and I'm the EV policy lead. I also am um, a member of the Young Energy Professionals Forum. Um, so I will be focusing on EVs and answering this question, but I completely appreciate that they aren't by any means a silver bullet, wildly expensive to say the least. Um, but in terms of, yes, that question on inspiring a greener vision for the future, um, helping build the mandate for change. Um, I want to focus on two things to begin with um, for those who for whom EVs are accessible, affordable, etc. Um, the first is the value of um, demand side response in this discussion. Um, so demand side response for me is a service that brings forward benefits of EVs, electric vehicles to both the energy system and to consumers. Um, I won't go into too much detail right now, but it essentially allows consumers to use electricity at a low cost um, whilst enabling energy to be more efficiently distributed on the grid. When used collectively in mass, um, it will help flatter peaks in demand, um, reduce the need for carbon intensive generation. Um, balance, uh, help manage costs of the electricity system, and ultimately, overall, uh, lower bills for consumers. And that's for all consumers, not just um, those who actively participate in the service. Um, so in terms of creating and inspiring a vision and building the mandate for change, like we know the benefits of demand side response, they're real, they're known, they're evidence tested, etc. And people are experiencing them right now. Um, however, there is a need to more convincingly and definitely for this industry more creatively convey this to uh, consumers, these benefits to consumers. Um, and uh, just to say, um, it's not just, uh, as I know, it's not just um, EVs that have this capability. Government have just consulted, Bayes have just consulted on the role of um, heat pumps and domestic battery units for this service as well. Um, the second point I wanted to raise, it kind of comes back to um, 
Ashok's point earlier. Um, Ashok, I think you spoke about the role of gov uh, role of government in convincing people on this narrative, and I don't want to put words into your mouth. So what I took from that is the role of government in convincing people to make the switch to um, EVs, then demand side response um, using that service later on. And I mean, I completely agree. The role of government in this entire conversation is especially this government, in my opinion, is stark. Um, however, there's also a role of industry to convince people, in my opinion, better than they are doing so right now. Um, so again, in my opinion, I think in the low carbon tech world, specifically for EV manufacturers, service providers, etc., I just don't think we've cracked the narrative on selling on our USP. Um, so at the end of the day, EVs are products. And weirdly, we depend largely on government to sell these products which other products don't have to do. Um, they have incredible manufacturing, uh, uh, marketing campaigns, um, ads, et cetera, things like that, that convince people. Um, and, you know, um, I think that is a problem for our industry that we depend so much on government to sell this narrative to, to consumers. Um, and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I was having a conversation with my flatmates earlier and it says, I'm gonna willingly push them under the bus here, but, um, they one of them is saving up to buy uh, a car and he wants an EV in particular. I told him that he can actually buy a cheaper EV right now, but he doesn't want to. He wants a Tesla and he wants it because it's a Tesla. I can't confidently say he wants it because it's the emissions that tailpipe, everything like that. Um, he wants it because it's a Tesla. Um, and for all of Tesla's faults, they have created this brand that is very recognizable, that has brought a lot of people into it. And I don't think the other um, OEMs who produce EVs have done that yet. Um, so that that's something to focus on, I think. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, I think I think that last point is is right again on the money in the sense that it doesn't matter that he doesn't want it because of the the emissions problem. Yeah. Really, I mean, you know, it it, it it it. I think there's going to become a point where people that will matter more, um, and yeah. we you know need to do what we can to ensure that 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 it keeps keeps you know rises up people's priorities but in essence it doesn't matter why people do stuff but um one of one something i wanted to ask about though is this whole demand response um element so it i just think there's a there's another sort of potential uh contradiction here in the energy right now is a big conversation and a topic of conversation and um i think like any crises there's an opportunity there but in general, people's energy use in the home is not something that people particularly can be bothered to engage with very much. Um, and yeah, and but at the same time, there's built real scepticism over energy providers and utility companies and, and so on. Um, how you know how are we going to again sort of sort of sell the idea that becoming involved managing your own energy being able to you know play the system play the game get more out of it um save money um you know how you know what is it that that companies need to do that that governments need to do to get people more engaged with this i mean contradictory to my second point there's the role of government in that which I completely stand by I think the first would be um, getting on with our smart meter rollout I think I can't remember I think we're maybe 50 60 percent through and that might be wrong um, I'll have to check my colleagues on that which which isn't great so, so there's a lot of households who don't have smart meters and who don't have that little device which will help them immensely in knowing what their energy usage is and potentially have to change it if they would like to as well um, so those kind of technologies are just so in, in my opinion from my experience easy to use and just so apparent in helping consumers and understand the energy system um and yet it's not it's not mandated there doesn't have to be a smart meter in every single new build house um government doesn't have those kind of policies in place they've uh now we do have policies in place for smart uh sorry for charge points um in new builds but we don't have a policy on smart meters in every new build we don't have a policy for heat pumps in every new build so it there is that role of government in getting these things his tech into you know public sphere in ways that they can and hopefully then that will build up people's understanding that these things exist and there are ways that they can help me um because they're literally in my house to begin with um that's one way i think and and, and any comment which you know is creep creeping in a little bit to the discussion already and may creep in more about you know we 
Are we just missing a big trick here about peer-to-peer -peer solutions and local community solutions? And is that not the way to inspire people? Because, you know, the, 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 whole, the whole demand response uh, solution is still being talked about as, you know, top-down, you know, really quite infrastructure heavy, certainly digital infrastructure heavy, etc. And the business models are sitting above, you know, what consumers are doing. And yet there are big opportunities for peer to peer trading of energy, as well as there is um, with respect to, to, to mobility. So, you know, is that just, you know, just noise not being taken seriously in, in the discussion? No, absolutely not just noise. Um, I mean, there are in terms of local community settings as well there is so much that i think local communities can do because of you know just the value of local communities and campaigning in the first place and getting people to understand about any topic i'd say um i know there are a bunch of project uh projects and i want to say edinburgh um i know you can perhaps correct me on that um which are looking on demand side response as a community together. I don't have the, they're essentially local energy systems um, and I don't have the details on them, but it's just that value of, I mean, in a sense it is still top down in a way, but um, it, it is just that value of building consumer understanding and educating consumers in a way that isn't as direct often as, you know, government intervention um, and the role of industry. Sorry, I've lost, I've lost zoom in my multiple tabs um the role the role of industry comes in there again like it's such a it's not just government that has to play this role um it's the entire energy system and then when it comes down to our friends and stuff like that as well friends and families okay and i think anthony wanted to come in with a question for you yes thank you um oh gosh i'm not sure i live on the same planet um in terms of demand um management for energy the price signals that are shocking through the system at the moment are surely making virtually everybody think about their use of energy because my obsessive turning off of lights has gone to a new level now because you know it's costing pounds every time you switch the light on and secondly i don't recognize what you said you man about car manufacturers creating a vision because adverts for cars and especially in the cinema are that it's all electric cars you know or every manufacturer is pushing their electric cars which is very ironic considering the delivery times if you order one today are probably about 12 to 18 months and the second hand prices for electric cars are now way above what they sold originally for so the vision that i think that's being quite successfully managed by car manufacturers is very lagging behind the reality of actually getting hold of these things which we're in a messy transition phase and it will it will you know come the end of the decade you'll get parity between electric cars and petrol cars in terms of price but until then we're in for quite a messy period i think yeah i mean like definitely live on the same planet as me um i also don't have a smart meter or a tesla or anything like that um but i work in this industry nonetheless um i think on that first point of um of uh energy prices right now i mean this is an unprecedented two years it's going to be an unprecedented further two years unfortunately um but at the same time like these are technologies that are accessible and useful for certain people and there's no reason i think why those certain people shouldn't be getting into them buying them if they can do when when that is when that is an opportunity for them and a possibility for them um and then whilst we're still doing all of that we can think of ways to help everyone else um get on track as well and uh for starting starting with just reducing the price of evs to begin with um in terms of the ads in cinemas and stuff like that i mean um i know shell recharge i've already um really in my opinion convincing one that i've seen recently and Again, I would say this as an EV policy manager, but what's the what's the problem with them? Um, again, I say this for the people for whom EVs are accessible and an opportunity and something that that they can get into, for use of a better word, right now. Um, so what's yeah? What it is a technology that helps. So um, yeah, I'm just not sure what the Okay, I, I mean, I, we definitely, definitely can have a whole, a whole seminar in, from my point of view on, on, um, on just that issue alone and, and the, the, the visions and the aspirations that car manufacturers um, 
have developed and continue to develop but i don't think we've quite got time but but we might get to it some more we'll see but we do have to move on in the interest of time so thank you um so next on my list is dave milner thanks julian i'm, I'm definitely not going to get into an ev debate now because i feel like that's gonna i was gonna suck up the rest of our time um yeah very nice to meet everyone um Thank you so much, Gillian, for asking me to be on the call. It's uh, quite, quite an extraordinary set of people. Uh, so I'm Dave Munn, Deputy Director at Create Streets, um, and we're looking at how we create uh, more healthy, happy, and sustainable lives through the built environment. And I'm very interested in movement as well and bringing that in. So um, in my sort of two and a half minutes that I've got left, I just thought I'd kind of go into some maybe quite sort of detailed or actually you know more, more sort of technical solutions to this, because I think we've kind of laid out the problem really well. Um, and cover what I see in movement, mass planning, and then retrofit, if those sort of three topics make sense, hopefully. I think sort of top line from where we're sitting, and if we're talking about the built environment here, um, is the desire for us to become uh, town builders. And I think we've probably realised that we're, we build a lot of homes, or maybe not that many homes, but actually these aren't necessarily all places, and they don't have hearts and middles and centres and places you can walk to. Um, we sort of got business parks and, and dormitories. Um, we, I do think the reality is we're still locked into car dependent sprawl. Um, even some of the big um, you know, master developer schemes that you go around now, they're not actually places. If I'm honest, they're sort of fairly nice cafes and co-working spaces on the edge of a wide road. Thanks, thumbs up from Richard there. So he agrees on that one. Um, so uh, so i think that's kind of a, a theme of this and sort of responding to anthony as well i, I agree in, in talking about positives um just thinking about what was uh, released from hammersmith and fulham they basically put together a really impressive package of ltns but they're called i think they're clean air zones or, or clean air neighborhoods which is that's the kind of branding we, we want and if you look at things like school streets and play streets that you have in the netherlands you know this is the, these are popular and this is the branding we need to talk about um so on to movement and i'll sort of rattle through a few sort of hows and, and a few solutions. I think it's moving towards focusing on access, not speed of movement. We need to stop optimizing a sort of particularly busy route or particularly busy you know, road junction or, or stretch of road and start looking at, okay, where are the areas, where are the neighborhoods, the bits of the country, which just have zero access. So they have to have um, cars. And it's, it's probably worth looking at, you know, the areas that are very highly congested and thinking, okay, well, here's a perfect light rail solution or here's a perfect rail solution to, to combating that, not trying to sort of squeeze a little bit more through that pipe. Um, yeah, and, and if we don't solve that, we're going to keep spending, you know, 1.4 billion on Black Cat and what is it, 10 and a bit billion on um, Lower Thames Crossing. Um, and where we're talking about cost of living and, you know, very finite resources, uh, transport's almost a sort of um, a lovely world where actually we do have quite a bit of resource if we sort of think about repurposing this and making this work a bit harder for us. Um, so I think we need to rethink transport planning, particularly the formula they use. We're slowly starting to see us moving towards a vision-based planning. So things like vision uh, transport planning, things like vision validate, decide and provide are being sort of gently asked for by a few local authorities. I think Oxfordshire has. Um, I think Surrey is starting to think a bit more about decide and provide and DFT are issuing guidance for local transport plans. So that's great, but we need to go further and faster. I think I'm sure L'Oreal come and talk about that a bit more afterwards um and and also sort of set exactly what we mean by vision-based transport plan because that could you can imagine that being diluted if we're not sort of careful um into talking about a range of solutions and a range of um both mass planning uh place making and you know bus act to travel etc solutions rather than just one or two um on mass planning i think it's about focusing development around transit um i think by leveraging policy in particular mppf um and other guidance to really map across modal share targets at the moment we have fairly good modal share targets or sort of okay modal share targets that doesn't come through into um into policy guidance so i think it's very easy still for developers to sort of wriggle out of this um and to just sort of say no to be honest i can't really hit that or i don't need to hit that therefore i'll, I'll, I'll sort of make an exemption um i think uh on on other mass plan things moving from a um parking minimum to a parking maximum um approach i think cambridge share is one of the good ones and uh, who does that at sunderland bits of sunderland do as well uh, and london of course but outside of london we we sort of have this real divergence i think between sort of a max car two and a half per household policy and car free and there's probably something in the middle car light one one you know vehicle per dwelling hopefully it's an ev plus a plus a hire or plus cargo bike plus an e-bike and i think this is something where we as um, designers, transport planners need to try and address that sort of missing middle part of people, you know, areas where 
we just don't have a tube style network and kind of you know remove ourselves from that london bubble but but really you know make the change from sort of two to one car per dwelling if we do that we can start to create a higher density you know low and mid-rise neighborhood that's that's probably acceptable to more people because we just you know swap you know gains a huge amount of land back from what what is originally parking um i think moving towards co we were talking about um i think it was councillor uh, smith talking about um uh, adding lots of you know we want to have you know more sustainable um buildings with better energy efficiency solar panels etc cetera, etc cetera, by codifying these things um it's something we talk about in create streets and not sort of saying you know in a design guide please do this but actually a, you must do this 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 and this there's a way there to move towards not just sustainable streets but sustainable neighborhoods we could codify high streets we could codify tight and narrow streets if you do that the the, the the cost isn't the cost might increase a bit but the developers will take that out of the land price because they're just going to you know they know they all have to do it if you have to do something they'll they'll negotiate that you know so the farmers will get you know a little bit less they'll still get enough but they'll get a little bit less when you get the land value uplift um and then you know by enshrining things like manual streets into policy uh, instead of using some of the uh, sort of heavy road guidance that we are using there's an opportunity um, if I've got enough, you can interrupt if you want, but if I've got enough time just on retrofit, because I think that's probably one of the most important things because new places are, you know, potentially will be underwater then, but, you know, new places, um, the existing places uh, are, should be one of our first focuses. I think there's an opportunity to look at urban road space reallocation, um, in particular, where you've got lots of sort of four, five, six lane motorways going through busy towns, busy cities, this idea that we're sort of talking about of building on the road belt rather than the green belt is, is hopefully going to take off maybe well, maybe not um and trying to allow the intensification of suburbs through mechanisms potentially things like street votes or something linked to that because if you can really sort of leverage these um you know low density zone five six areas you can then start to create the places and the you know you start to create the businesses the jobs the retail that can support that and support more walking and i think finally we touched on the high streets that's that's hugely important if we can um, try and you know, help help the high streets, help them evolve into becoming places you meet and you want to be in. Um, that's important because if we're going to ask people to live a little bit more closely, a bit more proximately to to town centres, you've got to give them a carrot to do it with. So let's create you know really beautiful, amazing high streets, clean air, green, lots of stuff to do. Understanding that then people might make the trade off, so they have like ten square meters less. Maybe their garden is half the size, but they've got all these amazing amenities and good transport infrastructure. Um, I might I'll, I'll pause there. David, thank you. That's some really, really good stuff in there about, about placemaking and, and, and lots of detail under there. I am going to move us on rather than um, uh, interjecting each time because I really want to, to hear from, from you guys um, and we're, we're, the clock's ticking. So next up is Laurie, who, uh, Laurie Pickup, who I um, have not had the pleasure of speaking with, it seems like, um, just years and years. So hi. Hi, hello, hello from Italy. I'm giving the Alistair Cook uh, presentation here from abroad. Um, and uh, lovely to see you. And I'm sorry I missed the last presentation, uh, the last uh, uh, event in the spring. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know the detail of UK legislation, regulations and so on. I'm a little bit away from that. But I, I just wanted to make some points about the, the questions, which I think are really well uh, uh, posed. Um, uh, how to influence government over the next two years? I think that it, I, I, I think the main thing is for the government to accept that predict and provide is dead in the water, um, and to make the point very, very strongly because you you can't achieve sustainability in low carbon with predict and provide, and yet we we amble along thinking that we can just carry on. Uh, tweaking the way we plan uh, and of course vision and validate I'm more of a vision and validate person uh, was written into the government's transport strategy so that that's a positive move that's something we're meant to be positive um, and the the colleague that Peter Jones uh, referred to with the zero uh, carbon pathway model was in fact one of my team at, uh, at Vectos and that, I'm so glad that that's been accepted by the European Investment Bank as something that cities and local authorities can use. Um, one point I would say is that when our planners go to planning inquiries, um, 
quite quite often we try and push vision and validate and a new way of doing things and it keeps coming back at us and saying well give us an example give us best practice well of course we're in we're in new territory here and you can't always uh, give the barrister exactly what he wants in terms of example a b and c they work in the world of precedence um, so I think that this is something where there really could be progress in the next couple of years. Um, in terms of what would a sustainable lifestyle look like, um, I, I wrote that article for Transport Times last year that arguing that things are now digital, they're physical and digital, and we need to start planning, recognising that mobility is both of those things. Of course, it always has been to some extent with telephones. Um, but now it is more ingrained in, in what we do. I, th I think lifestyle can be more localised, um, the sort of thing Dave was just talking about. Uh, an emphasis on walking. I think cycling's had a good 20 years. Uh, I, I do believe that we should start developing walking infrastructure, not just for your average walker, but for people with all um all abilities to walk and some people may actually be using little buggies to get around but but something that really focuses on neighborhood planning for walking uh, we're talking with developers at the moment about uh, houses uh, with zero or one car spaces as the main thing and the new government seems to be interested in this and when we've looked at this we said well actually it needs to be turned on its head um, we should be trying to plan neighbourhoods uh, for more walk, for more walking and cycling, um, uh, uh, and then people. If you if you give people uh, a good environment, they will migrate into it. I'm not a great believer anymore in eureka moments in behaviour change. I think if you create the environment, you're not pushing people to do something; they will gradually move in. Um, uh, one issue is that I think we need to be more secure in the way we plan. I would hope the government can come forward with things like this. I advise the World Bank for some years now on gender and transport. Um, and the issue of sexual harassment of women on transport is one of the biggest transport problems in the world. And yet it's not recognized in any professional training. It might be on the ITS. If it's anywhere, it's on the ITS uh, MSc courses, but it's not uh, developed anywhere. Uh, and, and that half of the population feels unsafe. Um, and, and if you want growth, then, then please get women and girls to the courses they want, to the, to the jobs they need and to the leisure that they, that they deserve. Um, and, and that comes on to a point Anna made, actually, about social reality, um, that, that when I see some of the new designs of neighbourhoods, there are these nice green spaces, uh, but we all know places where these green spaces will be used not for a, a lovely get together of the local community, but there'll be people sleeping rough and there'll be people uh, dealing drugs under the bushes and they'll I mean this is the, this is social reality and I think sometimes when we design uh, placemaking with transport we we need to be hardcore and then I think she made the point then we can build the positive future um, not much longer uh, the pro public transport agenda well that, that was encouraging I didn't know that um, but I chaired the ITF uh, Rural Transport uh, Group. It's a global group last year, and there is a report available. But what came out of that was we need to be positive about our rural areas and new rural growth poles. Um, and from a transport point of view, I mean, I mean there's a whole language that's been in, invented by city people for people like me who live in rural areas, but my periphery is the edge of the city. Um, we need to ensure core networks, uh, that the core networks are subsidised and that they're maintained. And that gives space, as you were saying, Gillian, for local bottom-up innovation, for co-creation co of solutions, but they need an advisory agency. Now, this used to be the National Transport Advisory Agency. It's probably called something else now. But it's important that that is 
is in there so that they can advise on bottom-up agencies. I know in Scotland, there's a lot of, of interesting things going on there, but also investment by the local business community uh, in, in, in local transport. Um, so I think, um, what do we want our towns and cities to look like? Just as a, a final thing, I, I think we need to focus, yes, low carbon, but focus on resilience. Um, we live in a time where we can't take things for granted anymore. Um, it, 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 and it doesn't seem to be getting any better, but we need to be positive to see a way out of this. So I think if we're moving towards more local activity, um, more local facilities, locally supported facilities, perhaps with new business models, um, that we need to be more digital in the way we're thinking, the way we're planning. And this will mean governance changes. Quite a lot of it comes down to the fact that the organizations we have don't really have the responsibility to take the whole thing through. And I think that needs, that needs to be looked at. Um, emphasis on walking, as I said, um, and I think neighborhood workspaces, I think a great example of the great experience of the pandemic has shown us, yes, you can work from home, many can't, and we need to deal with that. Um, but there are drawbacks to working at home um, for a long period. Uh, and people are using a mix of going back into city offices, but neighborhood workspaces could be the answer here. And they, that could be the focus for creating uh, neighborhood consensus, as has been mentioned. Um, uh, I, think, I think really the other thing I'd like to say is we need to listen to all the generations. Um, the, uh, the love affair with millennials has been great, but I think we need to listen to all the generations. Uh, and, and, the, and of course, social diversity, I think, is essential. Uh, but I think others have made this point anyway. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll finish on that. And thanks for the opportunity for making the inter intervention. Sorry, thanks um, so much for that. Um, some, you know, re re really, really good points. Um, and I think that focus on, on resilience, but not in the way that I think I can be guilty of, of kind of bringing that to the table, i.e. just talking about the fact that the end of the world is nigh if we, if we don't sort of build up some adaptive capacity, but actually really the, the positive things about a community that, that, that has that capacity to be flexible and adapt and, and, and what that means and what that brings. So I think, I think that's really important. So thank you. Um, again, interest of time. So I uh, want, want to just move on for now and see, see where we get to. So Victoria Hills couldn't be here from the RTPI, but we have got Richard, which is great. I know you've had to uh, miss a little bit of, of the discussion in the middle. So, um, but hopefully you, you, you're, you feel, you feel integrated in um, and uh, yeah. Give us your give us your thoughts. Um, can you hear me? I sometimes have problems with Zoom. Um, first thing is, it's all very well talking about all these ideas, and it's great to hear that the Greater Cambridge Local Plan is proceeding. But across the country as a whole, you know, planning is almost at a standstill. Um, we have local planning authorities that have no staff at all to get them through periods like August. Other ones with twelve months unfilled vacancies so you know it's great that people are buying teslas but to be honest you know maybe uh, elon musk could finance a few local planning departments or even i notice the head count in the department for communities is three thousand five hundred people i mean if you divided all them up we could have 10 people in each local authority i see <laughs> ashok is 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 is, is uh, and Kamal are both nodding. So you know, it's a bit odd that we keep on piling on civil servants in the centre and we don't have anyone actually doing anything. Um, it's great that we are having, you know, the best local plans like the Greater Cambridge One are doing the, the best stuff. We do need to be aware though that, uh, as David was hinting, that additional development is a, a very much at the margin. So it's about what people do who are already housed 
and, and their behavior that's more important. And it's very important not to penalize new households. We see a lot of this with water and also with road use. You know, we, we don't want any more houses in this area because the roads are full. Well, the roads are full because you're using them. <laughs> why don't you stop using them? You know, why it should be people trying to get their first step on the housing ladder that are somehow held responsible for the whole of the community's sustainable behavior is, is quite honestly not equitable. You know, we do need to treat all residents the same, future and existing ones, and everyone needs to pay their play their role in reducing water use, reducing energy use, reducing vehicle use, and um, you know doing more walking and cycling. Um, I don't otherwise think I have much to add because all the other people have touched on you know how best to plan, uh, the best way of doing local plans, the best way of doing um, you know better housing estates. Um, I put on our research that says that in some parts of the country it's quicker to walk to the hospital than to use public transport so we are continuing to give permission in all the wrong places quite a lot of the time for um, new housing and if you look at the state of local bus services there's been some very impressive stories of people saying I mean, actually some from cambridge are saying i can't get to college anymore if they if they shut the bus, I can't get to college, I can't get to work. There are people, particularly younger people who are being completely cut out. And you know, don't believe it when people say, Oh, well, we'll put a bus service in and we'll subsidize it for the first year. And then five years later, the bus company says we can't afford to run it anymore. And so it's closed. So um, depending on long term funding of bus services, is a really critical problem, both in rural areas and in quite a lot of the, the suburbs. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Just, just, to, just to come back with one, one thing, I mean, I totally appreciate what you're saying with the, with the planning system being at a standstill um, and that we, you know, that in terms of uh, focusing on new housing developments, that, that's at the margins. Um, but what uh, what I wanted to ask you was, what role do you see for the public participation that we talk about, you know, and aspire to, and 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 this idea of of community community led decision making and input into the process of what happens um, in their communities? I mean, do do you see that you know we're we, we're starting to to that is that starting to happen? Are we still where we were two, two decades with that and not really being able to, to get the, the involvement of businesses and individuals involved in these decisions? Ooh, well, I think some people will say it's gone backwards. Um, a lot of people feel that planning is being done to them rather than that they're involved in it. Um, involving people is enormously expensive. So, uh, and local plan making is the part of planning that has the least funds of all. So if you want more people to be involved in decision making, someone's gonna have to pay for that. And that, you know, we haven't got an answer to that at the moment. Um, we need a way of funding local planning as opposed to funding development management. Um, it's great that we have, you know, new ways of doing it. And they are hopefully going to mean that more people feel able to join in. During the pandemic, a lot of things like planning committees were moved online entirely. And some of the evidence of assessing that is that more people were therefore involved. It also quite excitingly means the opportunity for more counts, more different kinds of people to become counsellors. Because if you can be a counsellor from your living room, it very much widens the kind of people who are able to volunteer and put themselves up for election than having to be you know, in a council town hall at 6 p.m. three days a week or you know, whatever it requires. So um, you know, digital is going to be a, a way forward, providing that we do also make sure that those that are uncomfortable with it are able to do so. So an idea of mine was sort of pop-up shops where you have a place where uh, if you're uncomfortable with using technology to interact with the planning system, but there's someone to sort of help you through and, you know, 
show you where to click and where to put your fingernail and how to sign off your thing. And if there's like a sort of uh, almost like an Apple store genius that will help you through the system, then that way we should be able to combat some of the digital exclusion that otherwise is a risk if you start moving a lot of consultation processes into digital only. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, um, we'll move on then to, to Ashok. Thank you, Gillian. I'm going to be very brief because you were so very kind to allow me an impolite interruption very right at the top of the, of the meeting to challenge the premise of the question. Forgive me, I'll put it in the chat. I'm going to challenge it again. Um, I'm, I'm very conscious that people like Bridget are showing enormous political bravery and could you could lose your position as a politician. And I just don't think we have addressed that central challenge enough in this debate. We've done what we usually do. I mean, look, we all go to praising visions. I do it as well. I try it, and pops perhaps very badly, I'm sure very badly. But if in the 30 years since Rio 92, we can't paint a vision between us, then what the heck have we been doing for 30 years? I don't think it's the vision thing that is going to help people like Bridget. I don't think it's the vision thing that's going to get um, a, a smart and fair road user charging through in London. And uh, and we're very good at talking about the solutions. We've got, we've got reams of solutions. We, we, can, we can talk forever about the solutions and great ideas, but who's listening? And have we talked about what the government is prepared to listen to? Have we talked about what the government in waiting in the Labour Party is prepared to listen to and what matters to them? I'll give you a couple of examples. I'll put it in the chat. Um, if you look at this current government, they're not very inclined towards public transport right? What are they inclined towards? Market-based solutions. So shared mobility solutions being provided by the public sector. Fantastic intervention from Ali. So if we're going to, Ali, if we're going to be talking about the vision thing, how about go trying to find an in with the current government around the role of the private sector in providing alternatives to private motor vehicle use, okay? That might be one avenue. It might be a terrible idea. I was at the Labour Party conference a couple of uh, weeks ago, engaging with people there and, and talking to shadow ministers. Labour has promised £28 billion pounds of um, per annum of transport decarbonisation money. OK, it's a lot of money, what, what, but that could easily be sliced. That could easily go. What will shore up the expenditure? Well, what is Labour interested in? It's interested in the cost to working people of going about their daily business. So how can we provide examples of how you integrate public transport with other systems so that the cost then becomes a, a tremendously um, uh, effective investment that catalyzes all sorts of other benefits down the chain, such as improvements to people's quality of, quality of life, urban, local urban economic regeneration and so on. I don't think we've spent enough time in this conversation saying who are the who's in government, who's likely to be in government, what are the kind of things they want to listen to, how can we therefore open up that conversation and apply and then talk about a mandate for change? Because there's no point in talking about a mandate for change on topics that matter to us, but don't matter to them. So I think we need to think a, a little more uh, closely about the, uh, about the politics here. And I just don't think inspiring greener visions of and by themselves will deliver zero carbon London by 2030, that's seven and a half years time. That's a 78% reduction in carbon emissions in seven and a half years time for where we are now on 50%. Or the 78% reduction in carbon emissions that needs to be delivered by 2035 in line with the six carbon budget. So I think we need to be a lot, hard, a lot more hard nosed because we can't rely on people like Bridget council by council across the country to put their jobs on the line. So what can we do to help people like Bridget. And as Ali's solution, I think that I'd love to have. And I think, can we do things like that with the Conservatives? Can we do things like that around local economic regeneration, jobs and skills with, uh, with the Labour Party? Ashok, thank you for that. And that, that definitely needed to be saying said. Um, and obviously I'm very interested what, what, what other people would say in response to that. What I would, what I would just say to you though, is that I think there's a, when we talk about a vision, I don't personally, and I and I don't think this is the case for for most people on here. We're we're not really talking about some idealized, uh, stylized view of the future. I mean, I think we've spoken a lot. Um, most people have spoken in one way or another about identifying where things are happening, 
um, as, uh, you know, as, as examples of what the positive future could look like if we did more of that. And I think, you know, and, and part of that will be understanding what the private sector is doing or could be doing more of. Um, but I do take your point that we, you know, we probably haven't talked enough about the current government priorities of the day um, and the fact that maybe they're not going to be around much longer and we need to think about um, about the next regime. I complete, completely agree with that. I think maybe there's been a little bit of a, a, a reticence to do that uh, just because it's such a difficult, uh, difficult subject. But, uh, but, but you're absolutely right. Of course, we can't get anywhere unless we start with, with um, what's going on um, in there in their heads and work from there outwards so so thank you I just pick up your post great positive examples i'll take you what you've just said how do we get the current government to pay attention to the positive examples yeah yeah because the positive examples achieve nothing unless they pay attention to them yeah yeah okay well that's 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 a good exam question Bridget you you had your hand up during that do you still want to come in at this point quickly or no, well, let, well, let me say, I mean I completely agree with that and I, I try very hard to avoid being political in discussions like this but you know we we're seeing a real lack of leadership from government and okay they are doing some investment in rail I wish the heck they'd let me know what's happening with East West Rail which has been on the cards for five years and is making my life misery because communities don't know what's happening I have a conservative MP launching a position a petition against introducing congestion charging that will reduce carbon emissions and will provide 50 million pounds a year for, for buses you know we're it makes it really, really difficult because, you know, the, the, all our ambition to make things better is politicised yeah. by people, you know, with political mileage to make out of it. And so, you know, it becomes political debates. And as you say, I, you know, I'm pretty sure I will I will lose my, my position over congestion charging. You know, hey ho, you know, I'll find something else to do. But, uh, you know, it's very difficult to be, a, you know, a really committed principal politician in this. We're seeing, you know... That's a long conversation. Enough said. <laughs> well, we all hope that, that that isn't what happened. But, you know, thank you for the frank, you know, acknowledgement of that. OK, Xavier. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Great. Thank you, Lynn. So I'll be very quick. I'm conscious that there's, there's several others left to speak. And um, I mean, I agree with so much that's been said. Um, I was just going to take the vision point first and say that so I'm CEO of Sustrans and our vision is a society where the way we travel creates healthier places and happier lives for everyone, which sounds a little trite, doesn't it, on one, on, on one level, but actually gets to the nub of this, which was said earlier, um, and, and not least by, by, by Bridget, which is actually what we're selling, if you like, what we've got here is actually good. There is a positive point here in terms of how people can live, but others have said that, so I won't re-emphasize that. I guess I just wanted to make two points that I think are additives. So the first is that, is I think the risk of polarization around climate change and the polarization of society. So I think that is that is such a huge risk, both globally, you know, nationally and locally. And, and I don't think it can be underestimated back to sort of what its impact on politics could be and then the ability to actually drive through change. So I think a lot of our role, and in the case of Sustrans as a civil society organization, is not to sort of pour oil on, on the fire, but to, to try and make to try and bring people together on issues that are really divisive, as we've seen with LTNs. And so you've seen it also with the pile on with British Cycling, who's gone and taken Shell as a sponsor. We, we're staying out of that. Um, and, and I think that, that the, the goal here is, is to bring people together. And I think that the comments in the chat and things people have said about, um, about proper co-creation, about citizens' assembly is part of that. It takes longer, but ultimately it's worthwhile. Um, because we have to support progress, but do it in a way that doesn't doesn't polarise. The second point I would make is is on technology, and so electric cars aren't the answer. Um, and I think that is, as you say, a topic of another sem another seminar. But you, we're not going to uninvent a car. Yeah, and, and cars are undoubtedly part of the mix. And and I think it's looking at both the explicit um, opportunities for positive change that tech brings. So I think that you know, several speakers have spoken about the, the rise in deliveries, decreased need for travel, all of that, but also if you like the unintended 
positive unintended consequences, and we might talk about the negative ones of technology, of which the most obvious is the question of road user charging, where it's now starting to feel that some sort of national road user pricing is, has to be inevitable because of the impact on tax take, which is, if you like, an unintended consequence, the one people could see coming of EVs. And that's a, that's a good thing, yeah, because in a way, tech, of which that's an example, provides inflection points where things can change. So back to sort of knowing, we know what the answer is with, you know, road user charging has been the obvious answer for years. Um, the question has been one of political pal palatability and how on earth do we bring it in? Well, actually the technology starts to provide, provide a lever for that. And I think seizing on opportunities like that, you know, tech enabled or others to actually, you know, inflection points, if you like, is something we're going to have to be doing and is a way to do that without polarizing and that can bring people together. So I, I could say lots of lots more, but um, conscious others have to speak and, and so many people have made such, you know, such great points. So thanks for the invitation and thanks for the thanks. conversation. Thanks, everyone. I really, really appreciate you you speeding up for us um, um, as we as we hit the clock, hit, hit the hour. So um, Jules. Yep. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jules Townsend. I'm Chief Executive of the Community Rail Network. So we uh, work to uh, support and, and encourage communities to get involved with local railways and stations. So hopefully we, we are a, a positive example of communities working collaboratively with the private sector. And it's been, as has been mentioned, uh, I think these sorts of examples are really, really helpful in, in engaging um uh politically at the moment um i, I was going to start by um saying uh, on a positive note that I, I really think it's it's not as hard as we might think to build a positive um vision for a greener transport future i think others have, have spoken to this if we take an empowering an engaging uh, approach to to working with local communities and, and notwithstanding that the, the um, political bravery that may be needed but I think when we really get out there within communities and, and have conversations with people even in very car dependent communities where we might experience we might expect some pushback um, my experience is that people are very much up for having these conversations as long as they feel that their voices can be heard um, and that they can be uh, you know a part of the change and help to shape that change I think you know of course people don't want to feel that um, uh, they're having changes done to them they want to feel in control of of their lives and and their local areas um, and I think that's particularly so on climate related issues you know we know that the climate crisis is inherently a disempowering subject uh, and if we if we if we don't approach it in a, in a suitably engaging way, you know, causes people to to turn away or, or, or react negatively. So I think um, we we need to look for opportunities to engage communities early and proactively in in transport and planning development. I know we've heard about some of the uh, significant resourcing challenges uh, around that. But I think we also need to make sure that um, transport operators uh, are engaging with communities and, and listening. Um, and, and there is work taking place within the rail industry gradually to uh, create a, a, a rail industry that's, that's more responsive to, to local needs. But, but I think that is a key area of focus, surely, across the transport field. Um, but I think it's also about thinking, uh, considering how we can tap into what's there already. I think, uh, ironically, community engagement is often approached in quite a top-down manner. How can we how can we do two communities in order for them to feel involved and positive about what we'd quite like to do anyway? Um, you, you know, we really need to be thinking about what's there, what's happening already at a community level, and there is lots happening. We might not have lots of local mobilisation specifically on green travel, but there's lots of mobilizations around the climate emergency. Um, there's, there's lots of mobilizations um, in terms of people working together to make their local areas better, fairer places. 
Um, uh, and, and so I think there's lots of opportunity for taking transport more into those spaces and connecting some of these groups up better with transport authorities and providers um, to enable local engagement to happen in, in ways that are truly bottom up, empowering, um, but also perhaps more, more cost effective than some of the um, means that have been mentioned, such as citizens' juries. Um, you know, I, I want to emphasize this, this infinite number of ways to involve communities in, in the process of change on, on green travel. And communities have, themselves have got, have got ideas and um, the creativity to, 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 to involve others in, within their local area. So I, I think, you know, we don't need to think that we've got, we've got all the answers on that. Um, and, and certainly from our experience in Community Rail, where, where initiatives are truly community led, um, it is hugely beneficial, um, as, as Xavier said, you know, really bringing people together, delivering um, social benefits, social, a sense of connectedness within communities, cohesion benefits, as well as, uh, of course, creating um, innovations and and, um, uh, and and interventions that are that are better suited to, to local needs and what people um, what people want and, and need. Um, I just wanted to. I know we're we're running short on time. I, I just really wanted to finish by drawing attention to the to the last question on the list, which I just was really pleased to see that included. And I think it's such an incredibly important point for us all to be thinking about how can we treat people more like citizens um uh and uh, and i think we we need to stop assuming that people everyone likes the status quo and everyone wants to carry on driving everywhere all the time i think that's that's not the reality and if we get past that we we perhaps realize that we don't need to persuade people to make better choices um and i think that that language is really important here because you know when we talk about people making different choices we are constructing people as consumers um and we're not acknowledging as we've as we've said today you know the huge array of um factors and constraints um uh, that surround people's transport behaviors it's not nearly so simple as people suddenly deciding uh to choose a different um a different way to get around. We need to really understand and break down those barriers and, and work with people um, to help people make change together. And I made this point in the in the chat earlier. I think the other issue with talking about um, people making different choices is we put we put a lot of um, burden on the shoulders of individuals. Um, whereas when we think about people making change together, um, you know, it, it creates that 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 momentum, that positivity, um, uh, and the change surely naturally follows. That's that's our experience anyway. We'll stop there. Thanks, thanks, Jules. That's 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 great. Um, we are pushed to get pushed for time. Um, if it's okay with everyone, we will go on just about five five minutes past the hour. Definitely, definitely want to hear from Stephen and and Jacob. So, uh, Stephen, please. Right, I'll uh, speak as quickly as I can, Dylan, and, and go, um, I've only got three points to make, so this should be straightforward, and everyone has already said so many fantastic things, uh, and would agree with, with so much of what you have just said, Jules, um, on the range of ways in which you can mobilise and engage communities, so I think my starting point here is, is, number one, I think the diagnosis of the problem is absolutely right, we've just completed a piece of research looking at the existing UK-wide vision for transport and the associated decarbonisation pathway, um, the vision is not clear enough, so the decarbonisation pathway is not ambitious enough, it barely delivers on its own terms, of net zero by 2050 um, and it does not contain firm and funded commitments so we have a problem here um, that is undermining uh, the efforts needed across society to reach net zero and the work of local leaders in trying to convince their own communities to change uh, because the messaging at a national level is so uh, mixed um, but there are opportunities around kind of what we do next on that vision um, the government is not appealing the high court decision um, on its unlawful net zero strategy so they need to go back to the drawing board on that soon um, and we can influence that process with a narrative that we we want to see in there 
Um, the net zero review should not just be seen as just defending the progress we've already won. Um, we should be putting into that the things we want to see and the opportunities there and making the points that Ashok was making, like put it in the language that conservatives want to hear. That's going to be helpful. Uh, the Conservative Environment Network is still a strong caucus inside the Conservative Party. They want to hear this messaging and they want the evidence to to make their points um, and Labour is still very much in listening mode on all of the topics that we've just talked about from the role of electric vehicles through to what do you do with a bus service, what do you do with people's streets, what powers do local leaders need um, and we're kind of as, as many of you will be, will be in conversation with special advisors with shadow cabinet around these topics that, that, that there is so much scope for a better vision and a credible pathway to get there. Um, and the obvious point that Sammy have mentioned that central to that vision for us is that you have to tackle the inequalities that our current transport system is locking in, um, which have become so apparent during the pandemic, during this cost of living crisis. And with the deliberative research that we've done, uh, working with people for low income households, we heard everything that you've just described, Ashok. They want access to jobs, they want access to things that they care about, they want public transport that's affordable, they want safe streets for their kids to get to school. Like these are transactional, yes, but also aspirational and kind of things that we can point to in the future um, and finally and as it be clear from the points that i've been making in the chat uh, we think a fundamental to this is providing the public more a role in shaping that vision um, in understanding what the benefits of that will be in people's lives um, and we would like to see kind of having more role in holding areas to account to deliver on these things and having a more ongoing relationship with local decision makers at regional level, local level, uh, but also kind of at, at the national level as, as well. And I think I'll stop there, three points made. That's wonderful, thank you. Important point, well, lots of important points, point, point at the end there about, you know, we've talked a lot about local authorities and so on, not having the resources to do what they want to do, but we do have to keep them accountable for doing what they said they will, will do as well. Um, so I think, I think that's really, really important. Um, so then finally on the list is, is Jacob. Thanks very much. Um, so I'm a researcher at Lancaster and I work on public engagement and climate policy generally. Um, loads of great points. We'll try not to reiterate too many of them. Really loved a lot of what Ashok said and he, he said it much more eloquently than I could. My only point kind of from the research we've done is that there is a huge disconnect between if you ask people who's going to deliver this in terms of the net zero transition generally, it's always government. People understand the role of central government. They understand local authorities don't have many powers or don't have many resources. And they understand that them getting on a bus is not going to make the world a difference. So it's people come back to that point over and over again. And I think if that's not recognised in the language of any vision, then you're kind of talking past people. But there's a disjunct because if you say, okay, well, what are you going to do about it? They'll say, I'll recycle a bit more. They don't say, I'm going to get involved in any political activity. So there is a low level of political efficacy. People don't feel they have the power to change things. They don't have high trust in our political institutions. At the same time, they recognise that the change needs to come centrally. And unless we can stitch that gap together, I think we're a little bit dead in the water. So if I have a vision, it's some kind of vision where there is a positive cycle between people engaging in the different ways that we've talked, seeing that materially improve their lives, helping that build trust in the institutions that we have and building that positive circle around that people want to engage. Um, and I think we've heard good examples of how we do that here. But, you know, in terms of the engagement that we've talked, if people don't see material benefits from that, then that cycle will go into reverse. And I think there are some good examples of using deliberative methods locally and actually changing stuff that can be changed within the power of local authorities. People have to make their own judgment about whether or not this government's worth engaging with on these, these issues, not the May or the Johnson government, but specifically this one. Um, but yeah, I think looking forward to what the future administration is going to look like and whether there are opportunities there for sort of embedding, as I say, this virtuous circle. Uh, and I'll leave it there. Thanks so much. That's wonderful. And, and another important reality check about the agency that people feel that they have. Um, so even if we set up some really good deliberative processes and so on, they have to see uh, well, a, they have to feel that their efforts in engaging will, will lead to fruition, but, but, but the point is they have to see something actually happening um, on the ground. Okay, so we've obviously, we've, we've run over, uh, over time a little bit, um, and um, 
which is a, which is a real shame because we can now go around for another two hours actually really pulling apart some of, of what of what we all said of course um which uh, i'd be happy to do but not right now um uh, on another day i you know i do think we've had a positive conversation but i think one of the big dilemmas of trying to have a positive conversation is that we've we, we know the realities and we can't ignore the realities and the realities are really difficult and, and really challenging but i think um as as a result of you know sort of just trying to to do it that that way round um we have you know pointed out some things that, that, that are working, um, but also just the, the principle of the fact that action is what drives um, further action, drives belief. We have to, you know, we have to actually find the pockets of, of success and activity and, and, and have them work harder for us. I think with respect to creating a vision, I think we've all got, uh, uh, you know, some different views on what we mean by that. And, you know, and that's problematic. And, may, and maybe, maybe it's worth sort of just, you know, uh, having more discussion about what we mean by that. But really, it is about who who is listening um, and, uh, you know, to, to whatever we're putting forward, who is listening and what is their priorities. Um, and, you um, uh, I think, you know, we don't, despite all of us for many years talking about uh, the, the, the positive benefits that can come, the jobs and skills creation, the levelling up agenda, which of course seems to have disappeared in, in recent weeks, um, the, all, all, the, all the social benefits and so on. I, I think we all still know full well that we don't um, have in many respects not all of that but we don't have really good evidence that we can we 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 can, we can actually put against what we say to the people for whom that evidence would actually make a difference um to their behavior and we're talking about you know all, all layers of of decision making um and i and you know i'm not saying that because i'm an academic and i like to you know go off and say more research is required i i genuinely think that there has been, you know, um, the, the some of the some, you know, some of the central things, things that we know are central about the value of um, different ways of configuring our mobility system and the value that that brings. Um, in in and if we have to translate that into monetary terms, because that's what talks, so be it. I still think we don't we don't do not do that uh, well enough. And um, and we, we talked a lot about the value of, of resilience and resilience, developing, creating resilient communities as being one of the things that, that we, we think is worth focusing on as, as possibly having uh, gaining traction. Um, but what do we mean by that? What, what do we really think the ingredients of that are and the value of that uh, will be um, set against some of some of the the sort of future challenges um, that, that communities are going to be facing. Um, so I, I will leave it there. There's so much I could say. I've obviously not uh, done any justice whatsoever to the conversation uh, in my summing up. Um, but um, I, I think it has been brilliant. And um, yeah, um, we will we will see what happens with uh, with what's going to be done with the transcripts and, and so on. Um, Claire, I will just give you the, the final word, though. Well, the final word obviously has to be a massive thank you. Brilliant discussion. Jim, this is, you've drawn this out. This has been brilliant. So much to take away now. We will, in the usual way, really look, listen back, reflect. We will discuss this at the Green and Transport Council meeting. They will, you will hear from us. Um, this, this, is, this has been an invaluable discussion. I know, I can feel it in my bones. <laughs> Got some real gems, so you'll hear from us. But yeah, huge thank you to everyone for your time and for all of your brilliant contributions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone.